now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Alrighty, day of drama here. We'll start off with uh, Mr. President starring Edward Arnold. A wonderful program with a, an amazing premise, and uh, I think it was very underrated. We're also going to have an episode, Let George Do It, starring Bob Bailey and Virginia Gregg. Inner Sanctum Mysteries, Elspeth Eric stars in Lady with a Plan. Uh, a look at the news of that date. Then we'll have Nick Carter, Master Detective in the Case of the Disappearing Corpse. And an episode of Superman. And remember, Superman only ran three days a week, so we're kind of going to alternate days on that. And uh, that's all what's coming up on this Tuesday, ninth day of April, 100th day of the year, 266 days left till we get to 2025. Uh, passing by a single vote, the Senate ratified a treaty with Russia for the purchase of Alaska on this date in 1867. In 1939, Marian Anderson singing at the Lincoln Memorial after having been refused the right to sing at the Daughters of the American Revolution Const- Constitution Hall. Ladies and gentlemen, in this great auditorium under the sky, All of us are free. When God gave us this wonderful outdoors and the sun, the moon, and the stars, he made no distinction of race or creed or color. Now, because of this controversy, and by the way, you heard there Marian Anderson, introduction by then Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes. Uh, uh, It was a controversial event, and I'll talk just a little bit about that, because First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a DAR member at the time, she resigned from the Daughters of the American Revolution, writing to the organization saying, I'm in complete disagreement with the attitude taken in refusing Constitution Hall to a great artist. You had an opportunity to lead in an enlightened way, and it seems to me that your organization has failed. Uh, Now, uh, author Zora Neale Hurston criticized Roosevelt's refusal to condemn the Board of Education of Washington's simultaneous decision to exclude Anderson from singing at the segregated white Central High School. Now, uh, the controversy grew media uh, overwhelmingly backed Anderson's right to sing. Philadelphia Tribune, an African-American paper, wrote a group of doddering old ladies who don't know the difference between patriotism and putridism have compelled the gracious First Lady to apologize for their national rudeness. Uh, The Richmond Times-Dispatch wrote, In these days of racial intolerance so crudely expressed in the Third Reich, an action such as the DAR's band seems all the more deplorable. Uh, I I have to tell you, and I'm not going to go on uh, this because I know some of you don't like when I get into politics, but my goodness, um, this could have been a breakthrough moment from the DAR. And the DAR has since backed off on this, and they have sought out people who they previously excluded who had ties to the uh, 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 Revolutionary War and tried to be more inclusive. But boy, this was a black eye on America right on the cusp 
of World War II. Uh, speaking of World War II, the most brutal event in the Pacific portion of World War II began on this date in 1942 in the Philippines, the Bataan Death March. I will warn you, this eyewitness account is not for the squeamish. We started the Death March in groups of 100, about three or 4,000 of us in the line, marching by fours. About three Jap guards to a hundred of us. Didn't see any officers. Mostly those superior privates of theirs. Men with two or three stars in their uniforms. They'd slap our soldiers across the face, beat them up. I saw one of our men carrying a new pair of shoes. He sat down to take off his old shoes. The Japs came up and took away both pairs. That lieutenant walked seven days in the death march. And when we arrived at the end of the journey, he didn't have feet. Just a mass of infected blisters. Differing sources report widely differing prisoner of war casualties prior to reaching Camp O'Donnell from 5,000 to 18,000 Filipino deaths and 500 to 650 American deaths during the march, proving that what General William Tecumseh Sherman said during the American Civil War, war is hell and you cannot refine it. I, I have visited the Philippines a number of times. I have not been to Bataan. I will go to uh, Bataan in a future visit. And when I do, I will pray for those who lost their lives and who fought for victory against Japan. I hold no grudge toward the Japanese people, none whatsoever, because the Japanese today are different from those Japanese in a lot of ways. A U.S. Atomic Energy Commission formed on this date in 1945. Warner Brothers premiered the first 3D film, House of Wax, directed by Andre de Toth. Uh, it starred Vincent Price as Professor Henry Jarrett, a sculptor who created wax figures for a museum. After a fire destroyed his original museum, he rebuilt it using a new wax formula. The new figures were eerily lifelike. If you have not seen it, I urge you to see it. I don't know about the remake in 2005, but I would suggest just to see the delightful Vincent Price in his best. Uh, NASA, on this date in 1959, announced the selection of the United States' first seven astronauts. It's my pleasure to introduce to you, and I consider it a very real honor, gentlemen. From your right, Malcolm S. Carpenter, Leroy, Leroy G. Cooper, John H. Glenn, Virgil I. Grissom, Walter M. Shearer, Alan B. Shepard, Donald K. Slayton. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. Well, we would know them by different names along the line. The news media dubbed them the Mercury 7. In 1969, the Chicago 8 pled not guilty on federal charges of conspiracy to incite a riot at the 1968 Democrat National Convention in Chicago. After a bombing in West Berlin that killed two American servicemen was linked to Libya, President Reagan told United Press International's Helen Thomas on this date in 1986 his frank opinion on Libya's leader. We know that this mad dog of the Middle East has a, a goal of a world revolution, which is targeted on many of his own uh, Arab compatriots. And where we figure in that, uh, I don't know, maybe we're just the enemy because uh, it's a little like climbing Mount Everest, because we're here. Everyone's entitled to call him whatever animal they want, but... I think he's more than a bad smell. The president ordered retaliatory strikes against Tripoli and Benghazi 10 days later. In 1992, federal court found Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega guilty on drug and racketeering charges. President George Herbert Walker Bush reacted in a meeting with reporters prior to discussions with President Violeta Chamorro of Nicaragua. I think it's a major victory against the drug lords 
Uh, we're going to continue the fight against drugs in every way possible. But I think it's significant that he was accorded a uh, free and fair trial, and he was found guilty. And I hope it sends a lesson to uh, drug lords here and around the uh, around the world that they'll pay a price if they continue to poison the lives of our kids in this country or anywhere else. Meanwhile, Noriega's attorney, Frank Rubino, angrily fired back at the president. This, in our opinion, is the modern-day version of the Crusades, as the United States will now trample across the entire world, imposing its will upon so-called independent sovereign nations. Noriega was sentenced to 30 years in prison, and quite frankly, nations that allow drugs to filter into the U.S. over our wide-open southern border, they deserve no consideration because it's an assault on our nation, an assault on our children, and an assault on the weak in our country. We cannot have that happen. 1998, the National Prisoner of War Museum, located in Andersonville, Georgia, on the site of an old American Civil a war POW camp on this date in 1998. 2003, Baghdad fell to American forces in Iraq. And while there was a lot of celebration, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld told reporters it was not nearly over. There's a lot more fighting that's going to be done. There are more people are going to be killed. Let there be no doubt. This is not over despite all the celebrations on the street. Rumsfeld was right. The war continued until 2011, and it is truly not over yet as Iraq continues to uh, stir the pot in the Middle East and cause issues and enable terrorists. 2014, a student stabbed 20 people at Franklin Regional High School in Murraysboro, Pennsylvania, again proving that guns are not the problem. People are the problem. And in 2017, after refusing to give up his seat on an overbooked United Express flight, Dr. David Dao Dung Ang forcibly dragged off the flight by aviation security officers, leading to major criticism of United Airlines. And many people will not fly United to this date, um, you know, unless it's absolutely impossible. I want nothing to do with them. Anyway, passing away on this date, uh, architect Frank Lloyd Wright, singer Phil Ox, uh, singer Brooke Benton, rainy night in Georgia, so wonderful, David Prater of Sam and Dave, and uh, another figure in the 21 scandal, Charles Van Doren, passing away on this date. Birthdays on this date include Russian-born impresario Saul Hurok, singer-activist Paul Robeson. He may have been liberal, but my friends, he had a wonderful voice, and he was a good man. Actor Ward Bond, born on this date in history as well, as was uh, the publisher of Playboy, Hugh Hefner, musician Carl Perkins, his blue suede shoes, and uh, actor, a very funny man, Avery Schreiber, born on this date in history. And one of the men behind H.R. Puffin Stuff, Marty Croft, uh, passed away uh, last year at the age of 86, born on this date back in 1937. Hi, this is Jeff Foxworthy. It is now time for the birthday announcements. The following people are now officially older than dirt. And we start off with a man who was a wonderful satirist and still is a wonderful satirist, Tom Lehrer. He turns 96 years old today. Consider the following subtraction problem, which I will put up here. 342 minus 173. Now, remember how we used to do that. Three from two is nine, carry the one. And if you're under 35 or went to a private school, you say seven from three is six. But if you're over 35 and went to a public school, you say eight from four is six. And... carry the one, so we have 169. But in the new approach, as you know, the important thing is to understand what you're doing rather than to get the right answer. <laughs> Here's how they do it now. 
You can't take three from two. Two is less than three, so you look at the four in the tens place. Now that's really four tens, so you make it three tens, regroup, and you change a ten to ten ones, and you add them to the two and get twelve, and you take away three, that's nine. Is that clear? Now instead of four in the tens place, you've got three, because you added one, that is to say ten to the two, but you can't take seven from three, so you look in the hundreds place. From the three, you then use one to make ten ones, and you know why four plus minus one plus ten is fourteen minus one, because addition is commutative, right? And so you got thirteen tens, and you take away seven, and that leaves five. Well, six, actually, but... <laughs> The idea is the important thing. <laughs> Now go back to the hundreds place. You're left with two and you take away one from two and that leaves... Everybody get one? Not bad for the first day. Hooray for new math. New math. It won't do you a bit of good to read. New math. It's so simple. So very simple. That only a child can do it. From his 1965 album, New Math, Tom Lehrer, 96 years old today. Uh, she got four Emmys for portraying Olivia in the Waltons. Michael Learned is 85 today. Actor Dennis Quaid is 70. Paulina Poriskova, the super, Sports Illustrated supermodel, 59 today. From Sex and the City in the sequel, Cynthia Nixon is 58. Rudy from The Cosby Show has blossomed into a beautiful young lady, Keisha Knight Pulliam, 45. He knew his dad about uh, It Never Raining in Southern California and all the songs his dad wrote. Albert Hammond Jr. Uh, still uh, doing music, uh, playing guitar for The Strokes. Albert Hammond Jr., 44 today, uh, the son of Albert Hammond, yes. Uh, from Gossip Girl, Leighton Meester is 38. From All My Children and the band Dream Street, Jesse McCartney is 37. Uh, from Twilight and Snow White and the Huntsman, Kristen Stewart, 34 today. Uh, let's see, she was in The Great, Taken, and Super 8, L. Fanning, 26 today. And you remember her as the beautiful young girl from America's Got Talent. She's still making music today. Jackie Avancho is 24. I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down, and still somehow it's clouds, illusions. I recall, I really don't Oh, she still has such a beautiful voice, doesn't she? Jackie Avancho, who just did a, a new song uh, called Behind My Eyes. It, it does not show her voice as well as it should, but uh, she's still producing music. Jackie Avancho, 24 years old today. Those just a few of the people who celebrate the ninth day of April as their birthday. And if this is your birthday... We baked you a birthday cake If you get a tummy ache And you moan and groan and woe Don't forget we told you so Happy birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> Make a wish, dear, and blow out the candles Here they go! Well, there you go, the Stooges for us today. Uh, we're going to get to uh, some serious stuff here in a moment with an episode of Mr. President starring Edward Arnold from 74 years ago, April 9th, 1950. That's next here on this Tuesday, Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you suffering with anxiety, depression, PTSD, an eating disorder, or even a substance abuse problem? If it's causing problems at work or with your family, get help now. At Insight Mental Health and Wellness, we help and treat all types of depression and mental issues. We will help you use your insurance to get away from it all, to a beautiful sunny and tranquil vacation-like environment, so you can recharge yourself. And with the Family Medical Leave Act you could take the time off you need from work. Plus, with the Affordable Care Act, your treatment could be 100% covered. If you're suffering from any kind of anxiety, depression, PTSD, 
eating disorder, or even a substance abuse problem, use your insurance and get away from it all. Come to sunny California. Call Insight Mental Health and Wellness now. 800-281-8944 That's 800-281-8944 Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, an episode of Mr. President starring Edward Arnold. This goes back 74 years to April 9th, 1950. I do the very best I know how, the very best I can. And if the end brings me out wrong, ten angels swearing I was right would make no difference. Mr. President, starring Edward Arnold and written by Gene Holloway. Mr. President at home in the White House, the elected leader of our people, our fellow citizen and neighbor. These are little known stories of the men who have lived in the White House. Dramatic, exciting events in their lives that you and I so rarely hear. True human stories of Mr. President. Our Mr. President drama will begin in just a moment. The American concept of the president as a federal executive is unique in the history of world politics. When our Constitution was framed, many Americans thought president was just another word for king. In fact, some of the titles suggested as appropriate for the new head of state were Your Majesty the President, Your Mightiness, and Your Excellency. But Washington chose president, meaning the one who presides, a wise choice. For an American president is very much like a presiding chairman of a board who must maintain peace and amity among other divisions of the government. To such a coordinator come inevitable compromises, adjustments, and personal disappointments. You'll hear them dramatically presented now on Mr. President. So listen and see if you can name the president upon whom this episode is based. The incidents I have in mind today tell the story of a president of a strange dream. It's a story we've told before on this series, but one which we feel is well worth hearing again, especially during the Easter season. Later on, of course, I'll tell you which president this happened to. But meanwhile, you may be able to guess. He woke early. He woke to an unaccustomed, wonderful feeling of great happiness. And for a moment, he lay there wondering why. And then suddenly the warm, reassuring knowledge started pulsing through him again. The long war was over. He got up, put on a dressing gown, and went over to the window. He stood there looking out at the calm, sweet coming of the Washington dawn. From his window he could see the flags and buntings of victory, and he stood there grinning at them. Suddenly his bedroom door opened cautiously. Oh, good morning, Father. I thought you'd be up. Oh, good morning, son. You're up early. Well, I woke up. What are you going to do today? Oh, nothing very unusual. Office business, interviews, a cabinet meeting. Tonight, I think your mother and I are going out. You forgot the war department. Oh, yes, I did. You never mentioned them once. They wouldn't like that. (laughs) Well, I'll have to go to the war department at least twice, though. Looks like it's going to be a nice day. Yes, indeed. You know, sometimes you wake up and you think, this is my day. This is the day when things are going to go well for me. From beginning to end, this is my day. Didn't you ever feel that way? Yes, sir. A couple of times. And every time I did, I ended up getting a lick. <laughs> oh, and speaking of lickings, that reminds me. You are not to stand downstairs where the people wait for their interviews and charge them five cents to see me. Well, it's a very reasonable rate. Well, that's not the point. Well, you said you wanted me to be enterprising. Well, you'll have to find some other way to do it. Well, Secretary Stanton scolded me about that, too. He said you weren't worth five cents. 
Oh, he did? He said when anyone could see her for nothing, why should some people have to pay five cents? I don't think it's right. They should have to pay. Why? Because I need the money. Oh, I see, I see. Oh, good morning, Mother. Good morning. I thought I'd find you two in here together. Morning, dear. Good morning. Did you have a good night's sleep? Wonderful, Mary. And how about you? Well, the shouting in the streets kept me awake. Everyone's certainly excited about the prospect of peace. Well, those same voices put me to sleep. And it was the first good night's sleep I've had in months. Well, it's been a strain, but it's almost over now. Oh, son. Yes, Mother? There's a woman downstairs with a tray of apples and gingerbread and candy that she says you bought. I'll go right now. Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, they're steady. What's this all about? I'm setting up a fruit stand down the Grand Corridor. <laughs> You're doing what? A fruit stand. I'm going to show the people who are waiting in line to see Father. <laughs> now, see here, don't you laugh at him. You'll only encourage him. <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, son, uh, what did I just explain to you about people waiting for interviews? You said I couldn't charge him five cents to see you. Well, I should think not. But I'm not charging him to see Father now. I'm charging him for apples. This time they're getting something for the money. <laughs> oh, indeed, indeed. Well, you can't do it, and that's final. Uh, now, wait a minute, dear, wait a minute. Where did you get the money to buy this woman's stock? I saved my pocket money, and I got a few things from the White House kitchen by saying I was hungry. And one of the carpenters got me a pair of trestles and a wide board to put the things on. In the corridor of the White House? Well, I'm an American citizen. I got rights. You haven't any rights to peddle things in the White House. Well, I've already bought the thing. All right, all right, now... You go see your woman and set up your store. Gee, dear. thanks, Father. I knew you wouldn't let Mother take away my right. Oh, <laughs> we'll be the laughing stock of Washington. <laughs> my dear, he has to have a chance to learn a few things for himself, even if he is the son of a president. All children are entitled to put up some sort of a lemonade stand once in their lives. <laughs> All right, Mr. President. Uh, uh, come here by the window, my dear. Well, let me put my arm around you. That's a fine sight down there. Look at those red, white, and blue decorations. The Yankee Doodle colors of freedom and liberty and justice for all. Oh, it's good to see you so happy, dear. Oh, I am happy for the first time in a long, long while. I am happy. I can see an end to the insight now. Peace for the country and time for you and me to settle down and love one another. I'm afraid I haven't had much time to be a husband the past few years. I can't imagine a more fortunate woman in the nation than your wife, Mr. President. <laughs> oh, God, love you for saying that. Oh, darling, put me down. <laughs> you know someone came in. <laughs> Remember oh. when I used to spin you around oh, like this? Oh, someone <laughs> might see. <laughs> and if they do. Well, isn't it important that the president and his wife have dignity? <laughs> no, no, dear, not half so important as that the president and his wife be human beings. <laughs> I love you, and I don't care if the Senate, the House of Representatives, and the War Department know it. Oh, stop. <laughs> and see that I get a big breakfast this morning. Double on everything. You know, I could eat the White House? Yes, sir. Oh, I meant to ask you. Sunday's Easter. You'll want to give some sort of message, won't you? Is Sunday Easter? Yes, it is. Oh, I lost track of time. Then, then this is Good Friday. Yes, Good Friday. Mm-hmm. Well, the news of peace will certainly make it a joyous Easter. Woman, what about my breakfast? I'm hungry. Immediately, Mr. President. Thank you. to crawl with people. Oh, don't talk with your mouth full, son. Yes, it certainly is an exciting day. The general's arrived at the war department. Oh, he has, has he? And how is it that you get so much information before I do? Oh, I got connections. <laughs> hmm. Well, then maybe you know if the general and his wife are joining your father and me tonight. I uh, sent over a note asking them to go to the theater with us, dear. He doesn't know yet. Oh, he doesn't? And how do you know that? He hasn't had a chance to ask his wife. <clears throat> Are you inferring that a general who makes decisions involving thousands of men has to ask his wife if he can go out? Yes, sir. Mary, do you consider that democracy? <laughs> no, sir. That's marriage. 
Hello, Dad, Mother. Robert. Robert. Oh, Robert. Well, Robert. Well, Robert. Well, Robert. Robert. Yeah. Did you bring me any guns? Oh. It's so good to see you. You look fine. Oh, Robert, you. I've been so worried. We expected you in on leave last night. Sit down and have some breakfast. There's muffins and the war's over. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> it is wonderful, and I'm starved. Did you get wounded any place? No. Oh. Uh, did you want your brother to get wounded? Everybody I know has a wounded brother but me. Well, I'm glad I can't accommodate them. Uh, Sit down and have some breakfast, my son. Sit down. <laughs> We're going to the theater tonight, Robert. Would you like to go? Oh, I, I don't think so. Thank you, Mother. I think I'd just like to sit around and enjoy being home tonight. If anyone asks me, that is what I'd say. When you're bigger, we'll ask you. Well, I'd, be, I'd better be getting back to my desk. Speaker Colfax is coming over this morning to discuss government policy and Congressman Cole from California and John Creswell and... Mm, Father, why do they call it Good Friday? Why, it's the day that Christ was crucified, son. Well, why do they call it Good? Because Christ was good. Well, it wasn't a Good Friday. It was a bad Friday. Uh, son, I, uh, I don't have the time to talk to you about it now. Uh, but uh, you and I will have a talk uh, in the morning, shall we? I'll be glad it was tomorrow. Why? I don't like today. You mean you don't like this day or you don't like Good Friday? I don't know which it is, but, but it isn't a good day. It's a bad day. Son. It's a bad well, day. Well, son, don't talk like that. <laughs> yeah, dear, I wonder why you should feel that way, my boy. You didn't feel that way until I came in, did you? No. I know what it is. I've heard men talk like that at the front just before a battle. It's a sudden feeling of death in the air. It's because I've come back from the front. Theodore, come on. Let you and I go see to your fruit stand. Yes, sir. You'll forget all about it in a few minutes. It's not you, Robert. I know it isn't you. It's Good Friday. Come on, dear. Go with your mother, son. Yes, sir. That's strange. Don't worry about it. He's pretty sensitive in the combination of Good Friday and me coming back. And I'll have to talk to him about Easter the first minute I can. I, I don't think he understands it at all. Dear, hmm? do you mind terribly if we don't go to see Aladdin? Oh, I thought you wanted to see Aladdin. Well, Laura Keene is playing in Our American Cousin, and it's a benefit as well as her last appearance there, and I thought it might be nice if we went to see her. Well, why not, if that's what you'd enjoy, my dear? All right. I'll send word to the theater. Robert, you go ahead with your breakfast. I'm going to the war department. All right. Uh, uh, you take a look at your brother after a while and see if he's all right, will you? Sure. You'll find him in the Grand Corridor selling apples. Oh, sure. Doing what? Selling apples. What for? For money. He's going to make money selling apples? He thinks he is, but by the time he reimburses the White House kitchen for whatever he talked them out of, pays the carpenter for the use of the bench, and pays the government rent on the space in the car, he's not going to come out very well. <laughs> I'll see you this afternoon. Robert, I'm awfully glad you're home. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. General, it's good to see you. How are you, sir? Tired, but healthy as a knot. I'm glad to hear it. You're looking well. Victory becomes you. Thank you, sir. You seem in unusual spirits today, Mr. President. Yes, yes. Sit down, gentlemen. Sit down. I woke up feeling genuinely happy for the first time in years. You know something? We're going to receive good news today, Stanton. And Stanton, last night I had that dream again. Oh, did you, Mr. President? Mm -hmm. What dream was that, sir? Well, I've... I've dreamt it before every one of the important events of the war. I dream that I'm on a strange ship, a singular, indescribable vessel, and that I'm, I'm moving towards a dark, indefinite shore. And every time I dream it, victory follows. Isn't that right, Mr. Secretary? Yeah, that's what you say, Mr. President. I have no way of verifying your dreams. <clears throat> now, by the way, General, my wife tells me she's invited you and your wife to the theater with us tonight. Mr. President, you can't go to the theater tonight. Why not? It's not safe. Oh, nonsense. Why, if you and the General attended, it would be an admirable time for an assassin to kill both of you. Oh, you're an alarmist, Stanton, isn't he, General? I'm afraid I'm on the Secretary's side in this, Mr. President. I think it would be most unwise for you to make a public appearance at this time. Oh, I make public appearances every day and nobody shot me yet. You're getting to be a terrible nuisance, Stanton. For three years, every time I step out, cavalry, foot guards, plainclothes attendants spring from everywhere. 
I can't even go to the office alone. It's one of the penalties of being president. Oh, it's a lot of nonsense. Well, sir, in any case, I couldn't accompany you because I'm starting for home this afternoon to see my children. It's been a long time since I've seen... I understand. Please take them, my good wishes. Well, why don't you stay home and have a nice evening with your family, Mr. President? Because I am going to the theater. I want a little relaxation. I'll take Eckert with me. Now, sir... Did you know Eckert can break a poker over his arm, Mr. Secretary? Mr. President, whether Eckert can break a poker over his arm or not is completely outside the point. Oh, no, it isn't. No assassin would dare touch me with Eckert along. Eckert will be working with me tonight here at the War Department. Mr. Secretary, I'll wager that you're the kind of a man that goes to a zoo and doesn't take any peanuts. Whatever you may think of me, Mr. President, Eckert will still be working tonight. Very well, Mr. Secretary. I'll take Major Rathbun along. He isn't under your jurisdiction. Oh, Mr. President, if you'd only listen... Oh, smile, Mr. Secretary. The war is over. Peace is at hand. Surely even the President of the United States is entitled to one evening of relaxation. But he doesn't have to go to the theater for it. No, sir. I am going to the theater. My wife's going to get dressed up in her prettiest gown, and we're going to forget there was such a thing as a war for one whole evening. I tell you, today is my day, Stanton. From beginning to end, it's my day. Uh, very well, Mr. President. You will see that Major Rathman receives my invitation. Yes, I'll see that he receives it. Good. Come, General, it's time for the cabinet meeting. Yes, Mr. President. Uh, it does me good to get the best of you once in a while, Mr. Secretary. There's nothing I enjoy more than to win an argument with you. I hope you have won this argument, Mr. President. I sincerely hope you've won it. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll come back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. You know, it's been said that youth is too good to be wasted on the young. Well, that point is, of course, a moot one, but it is a fact that youth is too good to be wasted on tuberculosis, which took nearly 50,000 victims last year alone. 50,000 wasted lives is tragic. But the real tragedy lies in the fact that these deaths were unnecessary because tuberculosis can be cured if detected in time. Now, in the early stages, TB frequently has no symptoms, but its presence is easily detected with a chest X-ray. In some places, you can get a chest X-ray free or at a nominal cost through your local tuberculosis association or health department. To be sure that you're not one of the over half million people in the United States estimated to have TB, to protect yourself, to protect your family, have a chest X-ray taken as soon as possible. And now back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. You've probably guessed the name of the president in this story. Later on, of course, I'll tell you which one it was. After the cabinet meeting, the president had his lunch, and the excited voices of the people jubilantly crowding the streets of Washington lifted inside him. It was their day, and it was his. God was in his heaven, and all was right with the Union. After lunch, he started for his office. Would you like to buy an apple, sir? Uh, oh, hello, son. Yes, I think an apple is just what I need to polish off my lunch. Tell me, how's business? Oh, well, here you are. Five cents, please. Well, I have it right here. I have well, it business right. is slow this afternoon. Most everyone is going to church. Yes, of course, of course. Oh, that reminds me. I must think about some sort of an Easter message. Father, why was Christ crucified? Well, because there were people who hated him, son. People who didn't understand what he was trying to do. Bad people? Do you know what Christ said about them as he was dying? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And this was the day it happened? Yes. This was the day it happened. Well, could he have saved himself? Yes. Well, why didn't he? Because he wanted to show you and me and all the people before us and after us that death was not an end, that we, we should not be afraid. Well, I'm afraid today, Father. Of what, my boy? I don't know. Could I sleep with you tonight? Of course, of course. Do you have to go to the theater? Now, don't you start on me. Well, I'm lonesome for you. But how could you be lonesome for me when I'm right here? Well, I know, but I'm still lonesome for you. 
Son, I don't quite understand what's wrong with you today. I don't know what to say to you. Oh, here you are. This is the hardest house to find anyone in. Dear, I wondered if you wanted to take anyone else on our drive this afternoon. You have so many old friends in town. Oh, no. Let you and I go by ourselves this afternoon. Uh, Mary, hmm? uh, what do you think about the theater party? Do you still want to go? Well, dear, it's been announced that you'll be there now, and I think they've planned some special ceremony. Oh, then of course we'll go. I wouldn't want to disappoint the people. I thought you wanted to go. Well, I did, but Robert's come home when the little fellow was upset. Well, it's been announced and we'll go. I'd better get to my office. The carriage will be ready late this afternoon. Good, I'll enjoy your ride. This time of year, it's nice to get out into the country. Oh, oh, oh. Who's that? Why are you stopping, dear? Oh, it's so beautiful out here today. You know, Mary, it's good to be alive and to have you and the boys in a land like this to live in. Mary, as soon as these four years are over, let's find ourselves a farm on the banks of the Sangamon. And I'll, I'll take up my law practice again. Would you like that? I'd love it. And you and I will go to the country dances and show our children a thing or two. And I'll kiss you in the moonlight on the way home, mm -hmm. just as just as though we were courting all over again. Huh? Oh, my dear, I love you so. Maybe the last few years I haven't said it as often as I felt it. But I respect you and honor you and love you with my whole heart. And to have you to myself again. My dear, if it only happens... It's going to happen, my dear. We're going to settle down and live happily ever after. You and I and the children. You know, I've only seen you this joyous once before in my whole life. <laughs> the night before we were married? No. The night before our son William died. Mary. It's almost frightening to see you like this. As though someone thought... Let him be very happy today. Let him laugh. So that he'll be able to take the tears that will come tomorrow. Mary. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I, but I, I've been thinking it all day. You and the boy. It, it's foolish of me. <laughs> come on, dear. We better start back. You still have some more interviews and another trip to the war department to make before we can go to the theater. All right, Mary. All right. Come on, boy. Hey. It's an exciting day, isn't it, Mr. President? Yes, it is indeed, Mr. Crook. I'm sorry you have to walk along with me. I'm, I'm sure you'd like to be celebrating. Well, I'll celebrate later, sir. You know, I've been doing a lot of thinking today. I'm always joking with Stanton about all this mythical assailant and... Uh, but I believe there are men who want to take my life. And I have no doubt they'll do it. Well, this isn't like you, Mr. President. And it would be easy to do this very minute. Someone could shoot from a window or from around the corner. If anything happened to you, sir, it'd be the end of the country. Oh, oh. Don't you think it for one minute. This country isn't dependent on any one man. It isn't the leader that makes the country. It's the country that makes the leader. It isn't the man that makes the office of president. It's the office of president that makes the man. I am what the majority of the American people who elected me want me to be. When someone else takes my place, he'll be what the majority want him to be, or he won't be president very long. But still, sir, a man must have the, the makings of a president in him. Well, if a man is a good American, then he has the makings of a president. Oh, no, my friend. The loss of a single man can never hurt this nation. It will always put another man in office and go on. The nation may grieve, it may have a sense of loss, but it will go on. Well, sir, we'll hope that it won't have to go on without you. You know, Crook, I love this land of mine. I love our voices, the voices of the storms and the winds, the voice of the hammer and the saw, the voice of the railroad splitting the prairie with the challenge of civilization. The voice of the people arguing and growing by their arguments. Learning more and more every day what freedom means. And liberty. I hope I shall be listening to them for a long time yet. Don't misunderstand me. I, 
I have perfect confidence in every one of you men around me. I know no one could kill me and escape alive. But if it is to be done, it is impossible to prevent it. What is to be, will be. Isn't that right, Crook? I don't know, sir. I know. What is to be, will be. Madam President, I'm sure you're the grandest lady in Washington tonight. Turn uh-huh. around and let me view the other extremity of that gown. Do you like it? I'm overpowered by your <laughs> elegance. Come on, Mr. President. We don't want to miss the curtain. All right. I'm ready. I'm ready. Where are your gloves? Hmm, what gloves? Oh, they're in my pocket. Well? Uh, Mary, do I have to put them on? They're so uncomfortable. You're the president, dear. Oh, well, I never would have run for officers. I'd known I'd have to wear gloves. <laughs> Well, you can put them on just before we get to the theater. Carriage is waiting. Oh, it's a fine evening. Yes, yeah, be careful of your dress, my dear. Oh, good evening, Major Rathbun. Here, my dear, let me help you in. Thank you. Oh, how do you do, Major Rathbun? It's so nice to have you with us. Father! 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 Excuse me, my dear. <laughs> Tell me, what is the matter, son? What is I it? I found out what Good Friday's about. I found out what Easter's about. Oh, now, now, now. Here, here. (laughs) Tell me, what is it about, son? It's about death. They buried him and they sealed him in the tomb. It's about death. No, 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 son. It isn't about death. You've missed the whole point. It isn't about death. It's about resurrection. Do you have to go to the theater? Yes, of course I do. You know that. But I'll see you when I get home. Maybe I'll wake you up and you and I will have a glass of milk together, huh? Would you like that? Good Friday will be over then. Yes, Father. So run along up to bed. Good night, son. Goodbye, Father. <laughs> Goodbye, Father. Goodbye. Well, you've probably figured out by now who the president was when all that happened. It really did happen, you know, and you'll have the answer in just a moment. During the time the greatest story ever told has been on the air, it has won numerous awards from leading church authorities, critics, and newspapers. But some of the most memorable tributes to this Sunday evening program have been from the listeners themselves. Many of the letters people have written have been letters of appreciation, both to the sponsor and ABC, for dramatizing the powerful, inspiring story of the man who led the greatest life ever lived. Through the years, his messages and teachings have stood out like a beacon, giving courage and inspiration to millions. So listen today and every Sunday for the greatest story ever told when it's heard over these same ABC stations. And now back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. Enjoy the play, Major Rathbun and Miss Harris. I'm sure we will. We had originally planned to go to Grover's Theatre, but Mary thought as long as it was Miss Keene's closing performance, we should go to Ford's. Well, it's supposed to be a very worthwhile evening. I, 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 here we are, here we are. Oh, look at all the people. Put on your gloves, dear. Uh, yes, Mary, yes. Uh, come, ladies, let me help you out. I'm sure this will be a memorable evening for all of us. Uh, right this way, sir. Your box is ready for you, Mr. Lincoln. Be with us again next week, won't you, for another interesting story that happened in Washington a few years ago to Mr. President. Until then, goodbye. This program is produced and directed by Dick Woolen. 
Edward Arnold can currently be seen in the MGM picture, The Yellow Cab Man. Mr. President was created by Robert G. Jennings. Today's story was based on incidents in the life of President Abraham Lincoln. Be sure to listen again next week when the American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations bring you Edward Arnold with another interesting and factual story of Mr. President. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. From 74 years ago, April 9th, 1950, Mr. President and the story of the last day of Abraham Lincoln. Coming up next, Bob Bailey, Virginia Gregg, Let George Do It. President Biden recently released a massive $6 trillion budget, the largest budget in U.S. history. And guess who pays the bill? That's right, you, the American taxpayer. American citizens and business owners will be paying more taxes. That's a fact. And if you owe back taxes, they will be coming after you to collect payments. In fact, President Biden also hired thousands more IRS agents to go after you. If you got a letter from the IRS and you know you owe back taxes or you haven't filed in years, don't put your head in the sand. Call us today. We've saved our customers millions of tax dollars. One quick, free phone call will show you how we can reduce your past tax bill and save you thousands, guaranteed, or you pay nothing. Call now. 800-932-1431. 800-932-1431. That's 800-932-1431. Paid for by the Tax Helpline. Tomorrow on the Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox podcast, it'll all be about crime with the Crime Club, Gangbusters, an episode of Suspense, Dangerous Assignment, and The Strange Dr. Weird. But right now, an episode of the West Coast program, Let George Do It, Bob Bailey, Virginia Gregg, this episode goes back 73 years to April 9th, 1953, and uh, it is about Uncle Harry's bones. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, have you got any skeletons hanging in the closet? If so, dig them out and set them by the radio, because we have a dandy story that's going to make them feel right at home. It's called Uncle Harry's Bones, and it's complete, all except for his floating ribs he lost somewhere between 18th and 19th on Chestnut Street. Now, where they keep Uncle Harry's mortal remains, only time will tell. Besides, George Valentine has to have something to do for the next little while. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to go around saying, let George do it, which would not be good since that is his aim in life. Anyway, if the maestro will throw us a bone in E-flat, we'll get on with the epic. My dear Mr. Valentine, you will please report to me at the Stedman Farm, that's two miles down the road from Pine Lake, if you turn right at the Red Silk Post Office, or the house with the unpainted shutters if you come over the hill. I want you to clearly understand that you're working for me, no matter what anybody says. And Lordy knows the people around here know how to say things. For instance, they all say Uncle Harry is their uncle, but he's not. He's mine, and nobody else's. Mr. Valentine, please come quick. My trouble is I don't know if Uncle Harry is Uncle Harry or somebody else's who's not important. I've got to find out, now don't you think? Sincerely, Sophie Sturdivant. <laughs> Hey, friend. Hey, you. What's your trouble? Hello. We're looking for the Sturdivant place. Oh, well, down the road, past the hill. If you're looking for Doc Sellers, he's just gone into town, I think. Doc Sellers? Who's he? No, it's Sophie Sturdivant we wanted to see. Oh, Sophie. Her. <laughs> oh, what's funny? Eh, nothing. Doc's her brother. He's all right. Well, what's the matter with her? Nothing. Okay, thanks. Look out for your foot. Hey, hold up, hold up. 
Don't see many strangers around here. Where are you from? Looney Bin? Uh, Looney Bin? Sure. Uh, Sophie's all right. What are you driving at, Buster? My name's Dorky. What are you driving at? Say, tell me something. Where does Sophie's Uncle Harry live? Who? Uncle Harry. Some kind of a character around here, I get it. Nope. No Uncle Harry around here. But she wrote... Uh, Look, this is a nice, peaceful place. People don't like strangers making trouble. None of my business, none of yours. Let well enough alone, I say. You'll live longer. You know what I'd do if I were George? Go back to town. Ah, but not fearless Valentine. Besides, he's got Brooksy there to help him. Just like I've got this to help you. Now let's see if George and Brooksy took the old-timers' advice to get out of town. Nope, I guess they didn't. Because there they are, walking up to Sophie's front door. It's kind of a run-down place, isn't it? All the places around here seem to be, George. Yeah. Mrs. Sturdivant. The door's open. She's probably out back in the kitchen. Uh Mrs. Sturdivant? Sophie! Hmm. She's not in the kitchen, George. Of course she isn't, huh? What do you think does the cooking around here, anyway? Uh, Hello. We didn't mean to walk right in. You must be Doc Sellers. Well, I ain't Abraham Lincoln. You looking for Sophie? Uh Uh-huh. I'm George Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. I've seen your car out there. Just come in myself. Hey, sis! Come to the party. You're a doctor, are you? Sure, sure. (laughs) Want a pill? (laughs) <laughs> oh. <laughs> Pretty good size, huh? <laughs> no, I haven't practiced for years, but I still got these. I was over trying to unchoke a neighbor's horse yesterday. Eminent sawbones, that's me. Uh-huh, you're a vet. Yep. <laughs> Retired livestock killer. Sophie! Hey, Soap! Well, upstairs, I guess, working on a butterfly collection. Come on through. Sophie, for the love... She must have fallen down the stairs, George. I'm all right. I'm Here, all right. get her over to the couch. I'm all right. Lumsy ox, what'd you do? Tip over your own feet? Oh, here, let me. She didn't fall downstairs. Huh? Yes, I did. That's what I must have done. But how did your face get those blotches on it? How'd you get that black eye? Uh, no one hit me. What'd you say that for? I mean, I, I fell, that's all. Look, did somebody slap you, knock you no, down? No, 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 no. Well, who was it? Why? When did it happen? No, stop it. Stop it. Now. We've come to help you, Sophie. So I want you to tell us what... Oh. Huh? Huh? What are you looking at me for? No reason. Just wondered why she's still so scared. Oh, no, that's ridiculous. Doc's my brother. Oh, hey, Douglas! Douglas, come on in here. Is Douglas with you? Yeah, I just got back from looking at the old office. Oh, what did you find? Nothing, not a blame thing. Oh, look, both of you, what are you talking about? Yes, Doc, what is it? What do you want? Hey, Valentine, Miss Brooks, Douglas Kent. Just says your law, I'm not the kind of man beats up his own sister. Uh, how do you do? Hi. I... Sophie, what's happened? I'm all right, Douglas. Doug, here's another crazy, eager beaver like Sophie is, Mr. Valentine. Going off half-cocked whenever oh, he gets... Mr. Valentine's here to help us. Isn't that right, Sophie? He's here to help find out. Oh, look, will somebody please explain what this is all about? No. No, I I think that perhaps I was wrong. What? Mr. Valentine, I shouldn't have been so hasty in writing. Uncle Harry, that's what it's all about. Uncle Harry? No. No. Douglas and I only thought... Oh, be quiet, Soph. You started it, let's finish it. Come here, I'll show them to you. Show him? Uncle Harry. The great Uncle Harry, so they say. Yeah, see for yourself. <gasps> skeleton. Nothing but a skeleton. Uncle Harry's bone. Says you. I was out fishing in the lake, Mr. Valentine, and my line got tangled, and here he is. But just a skeleton. I don't see how you can tell. Who was Uncle Harry? Man disappeared five years ago. Man who bought out the breeding farms, a hermit. Sophie's uncle. Uh huh. Well, look, I don't know much about anatomy, but is a shin bone supposed to look like this? Well, go on, Doc. Tell him. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Jump to conclusions. Yeah. I made the mistake of remembering that I once set a fracture for Harry. That's all. It's what I get for playing M.D. We've been downtown looking for the X-rays in Doc's old office. 
We were going to the barn, too, to check in his old trunks and things. You see, I thought that if we could find the x-ray that he took five years ago, it might give us a positive way of identifying... Bones the... are bones. It's not going to tell you anything. How about this? A piece of rusty wire tangled around his leg. George. Well, the lake is full of stuff. It don't mean anything either. But it means something if we knew his leg was tied with wire before he died. Exactly, Mr. Valentine. That's just the way yeah, I... Yeah, see, everybody who reads mysteries goes off half-cocked. Well, what kind of a skeptic are you, Doc? Why don't you think it's Uncle Harry? Mister, I don't think one way or another. Only lots of people come up summers to fish in that lake. Could be practically anybody. Okay, Doc, I'm going to go with you to keep looking for that x-ray. Douglas, get the local sheriff up here as fast as you can. And tell him to send for a police x-ray man, too. Brooksy, take care of Sophie. Look, I I'm just as upset about Sophie as don't you are. Don't bother, Doc. I finally got the idea. It's a skeleton in the closet we're after. Well, come on, then. We're going to start opening doors. the blame leg in the first place if there was a real sawbones around. Last a bunch of recluses in this part of the woods. Yes, yeah, sir. Did you try this box here? Old Sears Roebuck catalogs. Ugh. Blast your cobwebs. Hey, how about the tin one? Uh, oh, yeah, let me see. Your x-ray stuff ought to be boxed up somewhere that you could find hey, it. Hey, Doc, where are you? Oh, is that you, Sheriff? Right here. Uh, come here, meet Mr. Valentine. Or some cleaning out an old attic. Why? Don't stick your paw at me, young man. Wow, wow, wow. What's your trouble, Sheriff? Don't you like to know what's going on in your territory? I know all about it. Don't need any city boys to come telling me what my job is. Uncle Harry disappeared five years ago. Let's leave him that way, I say. Uh huh. You're not interested in skeletons, huh? Sheriff, I think I'd like to have a little talk with oh, you before quit we. Put your blab and give us your pocket knife. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just airtight box. Maybe you got it. I. Don't know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that looks like negatives. That... Hey, look out for that spider. Yeah, open up closets. Got to expect to be in bit. Here. Let's see. Uh huh. Oh, that's that's a horse, isn't it? Uncle Harry, horse, spider. What difference does it make? Uncle Harry, there you are. Yeah, name, date, chin bone. Yeah, that's him, all right. Here, let's get it in the light. Well, Doc? Well, it could be the same as the skeleton. Yeah, looks the same to me. Set crooked on top there. Like a hundred others, I suppose. Holy smokes, Mr. Valentine, I can't tell for Sheriff, sure. did you get that police x-ray man? Yeah, over at the house. Mr. Kennedy. Okay, give me that x-ray. Come on. Absolutely. There's no question about it. But isn't it true lots of people have broken bones, Kennedy? I'll be glad to swear before a jury that this is the same bone. Before a jury? Of course, Mr. Valentine. Hasn't anyone here noticed the fracture in the skull? Mm. Here, right here. Why, no. Enough to cause death, I should say, in that location. I will also testify that the fracture must have been made before the body became a skeleton. In other words, the x-ray proves it's Uncle Harry. Precisely. And the combination of fracture and wire around the legs unquestionably proves that he was murdered. There you are. Quite simple. Murder. I knew it was Uncle Harry, all right, Sheriff, but the important thing is, who did sure, it? Sure, sure, Sophie. Now me and Mr. Valentine have Wait a minute, to... listen to her. Young lady, I've known Sophie for years, and anything But she that knows you... who killed him. She what? Of course I do. And I always knew it had happened, too. And that's why I hired you, Mr. Valentine, to catch him. Somewhere in Manitoba, Canada, I think, was the last place. You know, he sends me checks. You see, that's because he feels guilty about the way he treats me. Harry was a skin flint, a miser, a bloodsucker. I've sent descriptions. I've had detectives after him lots of times, but they've never been able now, to catch him. Wait a minute, wait a minute, please, both of you. She's talking about her husband, George, her second well, husband. He only married me because of Uncle Harry's money, and I was the relative, but Uncle Harry was too smart for him. He'd never give him any. Oh, no, not him. Sophie, why do you... Bunker, his name is, and when you find him, you'll hang him, won't you, Mr. Valentine? I know Bunker did it. He always said he got Harry's money, and five years ago he did it, don't you see? 
And then he disappeared. Hold it, hold it, would you please? This bunker, what happened? Was he a husband that ran away from you? <gasps> I beg your pardon? I sent him away, don't you understand? He was no good, and I sent him away. That's why I'm using my first husband's name. Bunker was a lying cheat, and he killed Uncle Harry, and I sent him away before I knew what he'd done. <laughs> well, get him, that's all. Get him and hang him. <laughs> And now, Valentine, will you listen to the voice of reason for a minute? Bunker ran away from Sophie in San Francisco, but it was two months before Uncle Harry disappeared. Oh. Sophie's just a little cracked on the subject, that's all. As I figure, Bunker's the one person probably didn't kill Uncle Harry. Forget him. What do you mean? Lonely area around here. Anything can happen. Nobody will be able to remember. Five years is a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I understand it all now. It isn't just the skeleton in her closet, is it? Nope. Yeah, Sophie wanted me to prove it was Uncle Harry so she could prove it was her no-good husband who did it. Instead, now we've got to solve a five-year-old crime that everybody else would have to have hushed up because everybody in the whole area is a suspect for murder. And you know who'll get the last laugh? <laughs> Uncle Harry's bones. <laughs> Now, tell me, how is that possible? For Uncle Harry to start laughing, that is. It isn't. Not unless all that's left of Harry is his funny bone, which is a nice, happy thought. However, in case it didn't hit you quite right, here's something that's not off the elbow. It seems your client, Sophie, is the only one who ever liked Uncle Harry. Everyone else, including the sheriff, would prefer to let sleeping dogs lie. And if your name is George Valentine, you know how hopeless it will be to try to solve a five-year-old crime when everyone in town is a suspect. Sheriff Harry was a miser, wasn't he? A hermit and a miser. What are you getting at? I don't know. Gold. Misers have gold, don't they? Of course they do. If they're smart, like Harry was. Well, sure, that's why he was killed, I guess. What do you mean? Well, most of his money was in property. But people always said he had a good many thousand dollars stashed away somewhere. Somewhere like where? Ooh, up around that place of his. I could never find any. And I'm the one who boarded the place up after he disappeared. I mean, Uncle Harry's place. You mean, you mean there's a house, a farm or something? It's a cabin. Nothing but a cabin. Well, come on, Brooksy. What are we waiting for? It's about a mile around the lake from here. I boarded her up solid in case he ever came back. George, what about Sophie? Never mind her. Now I know who smacked her. Not much of a cabin for a rich man, is it? No. Yeah. I don't know. At least he kept it neat and clean. Turn your flashlight over here. Oh. Just a desk, that's all. You think there's any point in going through it? Not if you're looking for money. Listen. Oh, it's just the wind, I guess. Hey, wait, Brooksy. What? A brick out of the fireplace. Yeah, a nice little hole underneath. Oh, maybe Uncle Harry did have some money. Sure, of course he did. What's the matter? Hole in the mattress. Place for a box, or... Oh. Hey, look out. Oh, I tripped. <laughs> Well, there's nothing funny about it. Yes, there is. Loose board, ain't it? This place is honeycomb with old hiding spots. Yeah. All of them empty. Look! Look, here's a coin. This one wasn't empty. I mean, once upon a time. None of them were, from the looks of it. I mean, that doesn't quite make sense, does it? What do you mean, George? You know, with the kind of tough old guy that Harry must have been. I don't... Duck, duck, Angel. What? Get down, get down. Turn off that flashlight. George? Take it easy now. This is who I think it is. The man with the shovel. I can see him in the doorway. Sure. All right, shut the door, Buster. There's a draft. Well, Never mind the match. George, look out for the shovel! 
Get away from me. All right, I guess now we can have some light, Angel. Well, it's our neighbor. What's your name? Dorky, that right? Let go of me. Sure, sure, I'll let go. The man who warned us away, the man who said Sophie was the just The man who warned Sophie away, you mean? What? I did not. You got mad and hit her, too. That's assault. Now, look, listen to All me. All a matter of geography. I remember what she wrote me about the two roads. And Doc Sellers and Douglas went to town this morning. That's in the other direction from your place by the hill. So how did you know that Doc had gone to town? He wouldn't have gone past you. That's the wrong direction. So I guess you knew he was gone because you'd been over there. Sophie herself must have told you where he was. All right. Don't prove anything. No, but your shovel does. I wondered why a guy who'd committed murder five years ago would be stupid enough to commit an overt act today. Murder? Now, look, I hated Uncle Harry, I sure, but I... didn't say you did, did I? Relax, relax, Buster. You're just a little greedy, that's all. Come digging for the miser's cash. George, I don't understand. When people thought Uncle Harry disappeared, they'd naturally assume he took his loot with him. Now it seems he was murdered. That makes it a little different. Nobody alive would be smart enough to kill him and find all of it. An old cowhide skin flint like that. I know, I know. That's why you wanted Sophie to stop raising alarm. If everybody knew for sure Uncle Harry was dead, why, you'd get trampled in the rush up here. He built me out of some of my property. You can't blame me Buster, for Buster, I'm day. not blaming you for anything. That's not my job. Now get out. Go on. Go home. George, what on Come on, come on. You heard me. There isn't any gold around here. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Don't you understand? We're all through with this case. Quiet, all of you, or I'll throw you out. Uh, go on, Doc. Uh, uh, sure, Coroner. There's not much to say. I've given him a testimony. He's identified the body. That's all we need from Doc Sellers. Well, Sheriff, who has got something to say? I understood this fellow, Valentine, had caught somebody up at Uncle Harry's shack. I know this isn't a court, but we sure want to hear everything that... I has haven't to... got anything to add, coroner. Now, see here, Valentine. No, no, coroner. I'm all through with this case. Yeah, I'm on my way back to the city. Valentine, Valentine. Yeah, yeah, what was the idea back there at the, at the inquest? There's no idea, Doc. Well, see here, if you think our sheriff is capable... The sheriff's all right, Douglas. Yeah, big compliment. <laughs> he only wishes it were true. All right, now listen, all of you. Uncle Harry was a heel. The whole town wished him dead. Sheriff, when the skeleton was found, your idea was to let sleeping dogs lie, huh? Well, not exactly, but holy smoke, we got to live with the people, you know. This place has been pretty nice for the past five years. Well, then... We'll take care of Dorky, all right. For but... assault, that's all, Sheriff. That's your business. Yeah, but now I got a murder to solve. You help get this rolling. You can't just walk all off. All right, and... all right. Keep your shirt on, Sheriff. You won't have to nail anybody in your town for murder. But you said that the. Well, mur- let's start at the beginning. Five years ago, Uncle Harry, the hermit, the miser, the boy with the gold. Somebody comes and tries to get his gold, kills him, takes his gold. But you've been up to the cabin, Sheriff. How did the killer find all the loot? In at least three separate hiding spots. Well, he could have twisted the old boy's arm or dug around. Nothing was disturbed. He went right to the spots. Yeah, I remember. And if he got rough with Harry, would Harry have told him where all the spots were? Well, no. I see what you mean. No, you don't, Douglas. Maybe Sophie's an unhappy, bitter woman, but uh, she had the right idea. Sheriff sent some telegrams to, uh, where was it she got her last money order from? Someplace in Manitoba, Canada? Bunker, that, that no good husband of hers, he's the one. Bunker? Well, I grant you, he could have come up here after he left Sophie in San Francisco. I guess nobody would have known if he was out at Harry's place. Yeah, but she's had detectives looking for Bunker, tracing those little, those little money orders he sent once in a while. Mm, that's right. They ain't been able to find him, Valentine. Okay, okay. But, Doc, you wouldn't be able to lie about x-rays of anybody who's still around here, would you? I mean, right out in public court and all? No, 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 you couldn't do that. You'd be caught up. What are you talking about? Perjury. I waited just long enough for you to commit perjury at the coroner's inquest, Doc. Well, what are you... What are you talking about? A tin box with a live spider in it. Spider? Yeah, that's what gave me the idea, and it's the only way to explain everything. Suppose the spider got in there when the box was open, say, a few days ago. By Doc alone. You're crazy. No more than your sister is. Suppose you switch some x-rays. We'll tie that together, what I said about Uncle Harry's hiding places. There's only one person who could have gone right to the hiding places. 
And that's Uncle Harry himself. No, now look... But he couldn't do that if he were dead, could he? All right, then. Suppose Doc here once treated a fracture for Bunker. Bunker? Yeah. Oh, boy, that would... Yeah, hey. simple as that. Five-year-old crime. Man killed another man, threw him in the lake. And now, because his sister would inherit some property and so on, Doc decides to make the skeleton into Uncle Harry. When it's really the skeleton of Bunker. That's not true. Now, Sheriff, you gotta believe me. Perjury, I Doc. Do... Perjury, remember? Uh. But, Sheriff, I think the reason detectives haven't been able to trace Bunker is pretty simple now, don't you? Wrong description. Just send a description to Canada of Uncle Harry. They'll get him all right. <laughs> and there you are, Sheriff. Instead of just a bunch of bones, Uncle Harry is a real live murderer. Uncle Harry? Well, I'll... Hey, Valentine, wait a minute. Where are you going? Back to the gal what brung me, Sophie. Yeah, there's a lot more important stuff to clear up in this case than dead skeletons. Yes, yeah, Sheriff, I got a live client to drag out of her closet. A gal who hired me and then slammed doors in my face. Why? Well, in a couple of seconds, I'll find out. You know, I'm kind of sorry for old Sophie. I've got a feeling that when George gets through with her, she'll be sorry the story wasn't called Aunt Sophie's Bones. But while we're waiting for the worst, let's give a listen to the best. He hated Harry. Bunker hated Harry. Sure, Sophie. He must have come here to get some money out of Harry, and, well, Harry defended himself, I guess. It's been sweet of Uncle Harry to send me the money orders all this time. Even if it is trapping you. Mm, I wouldn't be too sure it was sweet. It's kept the illusion that Bunker was still alive. He'd do that on purpose. Oh, yes. Perhaps. In fact, I wouldn't be too sure you love that uncle as much as you claim. I think you just hated Bunker. But now Bunker's dead. Now you know he's dead. People can waste a lot of time hating, can't they? Oh, Sophie, I'll tell you something. You wasted a lot of our time before I caught on why you hired me, then didn't want to talk. Well, I, I told you you were working. Well, I didn't think it was just Dorky's getting rough. It was the fact you began to remember whose leg had really been fractured, wasn't it? Well, I, I couldn't understand what the doc was up to. <laughs> I'm so glad it was only perjury. Makes me feel much better. He'd been willing to wait another two years. You might have had Uncle Harry declared legally dead and collected his property that way. Yeah, but Doc wouldn't wait, that's all. Too good an opportunity. <laughs> and the ironic part is, if it had worked, Uncle Harry couldn't have done anything about the inheritance slipping away from him. Not without admitting the whole story. Oh, I can see why Doc was tempted already. Right. Doc hated Harry. Such a waste of time. And you said that before. About hatred being a waste of time. I collect butterflies, you know. People say I have about as much brains as one. But anybody who wastes time is uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah, sure, butterflies, I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> He's stupid, isn't he? <laughs> Doesn't learn any lessons from seeing what happens from, from an unhappy marriage. Don't worry, Sophie, I'm the teacher. What? Hey, what is this? Come along, George. Time to say goodnight. Oh, now you haven't seen my butterfly collection. You come upstairs with me and I'll show you my real prizes. Well, you can hang Buster back in the closet now. It's all over. Oh, but before you do, be sure to tell it that uh, George Valentine was played by Robert Bailey and Virginia Gregg played Brooksy. The story was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, and Eddie Dunstetter dug up the music. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Seventy-three years ago, April 9th, 1951, 
Let George do it here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We'll have a pair coming up next from 1970, uh, 1946, rather, first with the Inner Sanctum Mysteries and then with Nick Carter, and in between the two, we'll have a look at the news of that date. Hang on. In times of economic uncertainty and chaos, your money means nothing. You may not even be able to get it from your bank or ATM. And the money you do have in the stock market will go down and down. What you can bank on is gold and silver. Gold and silver have been a reliable and trusted form of currency for thousands of years. Gold and silver have never been worth zero, and typically gold holds its value during economic turmoil. Call the gold hotline now and learn how to protect your money and your assets with gold and silver. And learn how to set up a new IRA or roll over your current one into a gold-backed IRA. Protect your money from the next market crash with gold and silver. Call now for your free gold guide. 800-515-6302. 800-515-6302. 800-515-6302. That's 800-515-6302. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we're going to reopen the creaking door. In the first of two shows from 1946, let, uh, this is Inner Sanctum Mystery, 78 years ago, and Elspeth Eric stars in Lady with a Plan. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Welcome once again, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Don't hesitate. Come right in. Once you get used to these grim surroundings, you'll never leave. Nobody ever does. Once you're in, you're out. (laughs) This is the kind of place that grips you. Mm -hmm. The kind of place where the bars hold and no holes are barred. So, come right in. Your only ticket of admission is your promise not to tell anybody about anything you may happen to hear tonight. Why, Mr. Host, don't ask people to promise a thing like that. No, Mary? No. During the next 52 seconds, our listeners are going to hear something that we definitely want them to tell other people about. And here it is. Lipton tea is the tea with the brisk flavor. Pass that information on to your friends and you'll really be doing them a good turn. Most of you regular Sanctum listeners know that Lipton's gives you top enjoyment. You've tried it, you've liked it. Now let your friends in on a good thing, too. Explain to them that brisk is the very word the tea experts themselves use to describe Lipton's fresh, lively, full-bodied flavor. Point out that Lipton's is never flat, never dull tasting, but always bright and tangy and delicious. One taste will prove that to anybody. In fact, it's already proved it to just about everybody. Because today you'll find Lipton's in more teacups than any other tea in the world. Yes, no other tea gives so much pleasure to so many people. Enjoy it and see that your friends enjoy it. Remember, Lipton tea is first in favor because it's brisk in flavor. And now for tonight's tale. Lady with a Plan, written especially for Inner Sanctum by Michael Sklar and Richard Manoff, and starring Elspeth Eric. It concerns a lady living in strange confinement and her fiendish scheme for escape. Moore Penitentiary is a sprawling mass of gray granite on a deserted landscape. To this grim and forbidding place has come a man with a purpose, to visit with Gladys Cross. He's a newspaper writer, and she is tomorrow's feature story. It's not a pretty story. I'll tell it right from the beginning. I'm no stranger to Moore Prison. I was a bride when I first came here. Wife of the warden, First lady of Moore Prison. 
<laughs> what a laugh. It was a strictly business proposition. Edward got a wife and I got security. And what I thought was a convenient way of life. But after two years of living like a prisoner in a house that was inside the walls of a jail, with a man who was 15 years older than I was, I'd had enough. But Edward had other ideas. <laughs> Divorce. <laughs> you don't mean a word of it, Gladys. Stop telling me what I mean. Will you give me a divorce? When you're feeling less excited, we can discuss this sense of... No, you can't put it off. I've had all I can take. I don't understand you, Gladys. I've been a model husband. Model husband? You've treated me the way you treat your prisoners. You don't beat them. You grind away at their nerves until their minds are so much mush. I'm getting out before it's too late. You're staying here with me where you belong. If you won't give me a divorce, I'll leave without it. Gladys, don't be a fool. No matter where you go, I'll bring you back. And I don't want to hurt you. You can't threaten me. Not you, my dear. I'm thinking of him. Him? How do you... What are you talking about? <laughs> so there is a man. You're inhuman. No, dear. Just a model husband. Trying to keep his home intact. <laughs> There was another man. Stephen Bromley and I were in love. Drawn together by a hate for more prison. Stephen was the assistant warden. I got word to him that I had to see him. To meet me that night at our secret rendezvous. A deserted side road two miles from the prison. When I got there in my car soon after dark, I didn't have long to wait. Stephen? Yes, Gladys. I came as fast as I could. Here, get in the car so we can talk. Something is wrong. I spoke to Edward this afternoon. He refused the divorce. And he threatened me if I left. He suspects there's someone else. What? He doesn't suspect it's me. You, his assistant, he'd never suspect you. He will eventually. We've got to get away. But Edward threatened me. Edward, Edward. Look ahead, Gladys. You know what'll happen. You've seen it happen to the prisoners. You'll snap. Your nerves will give way. He'll, he'll break you. Stephen, stop it. You know there's no way out. There is. If you're game... I know what you're thinking, but that's impossible. We could never get away with it. If we could, would you do it? Tell me how. Bucky Briggs. Briggs, the lifer? Uh-huh. I can have him transferred to work in the laundry. Assigned to handle your stuff when you bring it down. What are you getting at? Bucky hates the warden worse than you do. Given half the chance, he'd strangle him in a second. Now talk to him. Begin to feel sorry for him. Let him think you want to help him make a break. Then what? Then all we've got to do is give him the chance to use his hands on Edward. For two hours, we talked. By the time we parted, our plan had been worked out in detail. It was a plan for murder. Murder with clean hands. The next morning, I took my soiled linens and drove across the prison yard to the laundry. Bucky Briggs came out to the car. He didn't even look up at me. Where is it? In the back of the car. Here, let me open the door for you. I've heard quite a bit about you, Briggs. You want to take your fresh stuff home? But I don't really believe what they say. Look, lady, the warden needles me enough. I don't have to take it from you, too, see? Well, I don't know what you mean. You I want just... your fresh laundry, don't you? In a minute. I just want you to know that I'm interested in your case, Bucky. So is your husband. I'll get your laundry now. All right, Bucky. The seed was planted. All it needed was time. I began to plan the visits to the laundry in advance. The remarks I would use. Drop intimately. And at close quarters, out of the earshot of others. And after a month, it came like the fulfillment to a patient prayer. I was at the laundry waiting for Bucky to bring my clean stuff to the car. He came out, stepped into the car, took a quick glance around, and suddenly slipped close to me. It's up to you, baby. Get me out of here, and then it'll be you and me all the way. A deal? I've got it all figured out, Bucky. You don't waste time, beautiful. Give me the dope. Tomorrow, when I come back. Be ready. Check. I'll get word to some friends to pick me up on the outside. Just one more thing. My husband... It'll be a pleasure, baby. 
I made a final check with Stephen and then everything was set. I was sitting in the car the next day when Bucky came out. I reached over the front seat and opened the rear door for him. Get in, Bucky. And stay down. Spot me. It's been fixed. The guard's busy on the other side. Where are we going? To the house. What about the warden? He's in town today. Stop asking so many questions. Okay, baby. This is your show. Just make it good. This is the back of the house. There's not a soul in sight. Now follow me out. Hurry. That's the cellar door. Open it, Bucky. Right. Down the steps. Now what? The coal bin. Hide in there. You may have a long wait. I got patience, baby. I've been waiting two years for this. When it's clear, I'll call you. Three bangs on the steam pipe. I get you. That's when I take over. Our room is directly overhead on the second floor. Check. All right, Bucky. Get in the bin. Hold on, baby. That's no way to say goodbye. What? I like them personal. Like this. No, not now, Bucky. Not... Well, that's more like it. Something to remember you by. Edward returned an hour later. I was puttering around the dinner table too jittery to sit and wait for the commotion to break. And then, quicker than I expected, it happened. Siren, that must be the break. I know they can't get away with a break here. Hello. What the devil's happened? Briggs, form a searching party and wait for me. I'm coming over. Briggs is broken out. Can he saw him how he did it? No, but he won't get far. I'll find him. And when I do, I'll break him for good. Boy, Warden, you show him. But instead of listening to that alarm, you should have paid more attention to that wife of yours. Because that siren is cooking up something that'll be a real scream. <laughs> Did I hear someone say cooking? Yes, Mary. I was just remarking that our lady with a plan has something special on the fire. Oh, I see. Well, that's not exactly the kind of cooking I had in mind. Why, what were you thinking of, Mary? Well, what that word cooking made me think of was an early breakfast on a bright spring morning with a cup of piping hot, fragrant Lipton tea beside your plate. You see, when anyone says cooking, my mind just naturally turns to meals. And when I think of meals, I just naturally include Lipton's on the menu. Take that breakfast, for instance. When you add a cup of Lipton's to your regular bacon and eggs and toast, it can do wonders towards sparking up your first meal of the day. That wonderful, tantalizing aroma and lively, full-bodied flavor of Lipton tea starts your day off right. Yes, folks, at breakfast or at any time, Lipton's brisk flavor means added pleasure. Won't you try it soon? And now, back to Our Lady with a plan. <laughs> and what a plan. Her husband, Warden Cross of Moore Penitentiary, is searching for Bucky Briggs, an escaped convict. But Gladys has hidden Bucky in the cellar of the house. He's waiting there now to kill the warden. And Gladys, she's waiting too. For murder. I went up to bed after Edward left. And lay there tense. The sirens had stopped. For hours there was dead quiet everywhere. Then close to midnight I heard the door open downstairs. It was Edward. I could tell from his footsteps that he was tired, defeated. I lay perfectly still, waiting for him to come in. Gladys. Yes? You still up? Yes. Got away. It's 
incredible. He got away. And no one knows how. I didn't answer. He was a different person. Harried. Shaken. I watched him as he undressed. He looked suddenly older than ever. And I felt a sickening revulsion at the dejected spectacle he had become. I lay perfectly still as he slipped into bed and fell off to sleep. He was fast asleep now. I reached down over the side of the bed for my shoe and softly tapped its heel against the steam pipe. Edward was still asleep. I lay back and waited. Slowly. Slowly. And Bucky's silhouette stood outlined in the half-light from the hall. He moved quietly into the room right past me. In a moment, his big, hulking figure, looking more gorilla-like than ever, stood towering over Edward's bed. I saw his hands reach out cautiously for Edward, but just a moment too late. Get away from me. Get away. This is the payoff, one. Oh, Edward was awake. And like a flash, he twisted out of Bucky's reach. I sat there paralyzed as they both crashed to the floor. Desperately, Edward tried to tear Bucky's hands from the approach. But Bucky held on tighter and tighter, digging his fingers deeper into the soft flashiness of Edward's throat. Good. Good as well. You have it, Sag. I didn't move. I didn't speak. And he understood. Gladys, you'll never get away with this. Shut him up, Bucky. Easy, baby, easy. Another squeeze of his throat. Uh, just like you wanted him. I want to see for myself. You don't have to. When I twist her neck, it stays twisted. Dead. He's dead. Now get me out of here. There's a rope and a scaling hook behind the cellar door. Check. Stick close to the house until you reach the hedge. Then out across the south wall gate. Check. All right, I'll go. Don't you forget me something? What? Come here. Oh, please, step, Bucky, please. Mm. Mm. Well, gotta do this more often. Huh? I'm getting to like please, it. Please, go. Okay. Just one thing. Remember, give me two hours before you turn in the alarm. I'll be waiting for you out there. Goodbye, baby. <laughs> As soon as he was gone, I glanced at my watch and followed the second hand around twice. Now I was ready. You know, you know, who is this? It's Mrs. Cross. Bucky Briggs was hiding in our cellar all the time. He's killed my husband. Huh? Do something before it's too late. Which way to go? Toward the south wall. Nice. I put the phone down. My part was over. The rest was up to Stephen in the main tower. I waited five seconds, ten seconds, twenty seconds. Then all of a sudden it came like a million shrieking demons. From the window I saw the long fingers of the searchlights pointed at the south wall. And pinned beneath the glaring lights was Bucky, frantically pulling his way up the rope. I watched as the bullets hit all around him, kicking puffs of powder off the stone wall. One of them had to find his mark. Bucky shuddered, ripped, then caught himself. He was hit, he had to fall, but he didn't. Hand over hand, he started up again, higher and higher. He was hit again, but he didn't stop. And then before I could realize what had happened... He was over the top and gone. Hello? Mrs. Cross? You found him on the outside? No, not to trace him. Bucky got away. But how? He was hit twice. That's right. A car must have picked him up. But we'll get him. 
Unless those bullets kill him first. He's got to die. He can't live. He mustn't live. Don't worry, Mrs. Cross. We'll find him. Dead or alive. I hung up. Dazed. Now Bucky was out there. Waiting for me. The lights. The machine gun. He knew now that I'd double-crossed him. And he was waiting out there. To kill me. The next week was a nightmare. Edward's funeral, the messages of condolence. No chance to see Stephen alone. And then one night a week later, he came to me. Nervous, worried. We messed it up, Gladys. No trace of Briggs, which means he's alive and out there. And that's not so safe for you. But we're safe here. Of course, Gladys. But we just happen to be leaving here. Oh, no, Stephen, I'm not going. That's impossible. The new warden's arriving next Tuesday morning. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Gladys, even if you could stay on, I'd argue against it. But what about Briggs? It's a big world out there, remember? We'll get lost in it, you and I. So lost that no one will ever find us. Not even Briggs. Say you'll go. Well, I have no choice, I suppose. Good girl. Now, listen. I've got it all figured out. My resignation is in, takes effect next Tuesday night. Tuesday morning, you take the train to New York and head straight for the Hotel Empress. Don't budge out of your room. I'll be along in the evening, okay? You're not listening. I was thinking of something. What? Something Edward said when he died. Hmm? You'll never... Get away with this. Tuesday morning, I was on the train for New York. It was a short, pleasant trip. And my fears began to disappear. Once I reached the crowds of Grand Central Station, I knew I'd be safe. I threaded my way through the crowd. Just one of thousands of people... And suddenly there was a hand on my shoulder. Hello, baby. Bucky. What what are you doing doing here? How did you find me? I've been waiting for you, baby. Like I said. I got friends back there. The grapevine tipped me off when you was leaving, and here I am. But 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 I the bullets (laughs) just like nothing. Takes a lot to stop me. Come on, let's get out of here before some bulls bust me. Wait, Bucky, just just give me a minute. I've got to call my hotel. To, to hold my room for me. Can't I wait? Well, if I don't call, they'll cancel it. Mm, okay, but only a minute. Make your call over there so I can keep my eye on you, sweetheart. I don't want to lose you. Bucky had nodded toward a drugstore. It was a slim chance, but it was better than I'd expected. I entered the store, made a quick dash for the other door. I flung it open and raced madly toward the taxi stand. Over my shoulder, I caught a glimpse of Bucky. He'd seen me. Hey, wait a minute. I ran to the cab and jumped in. Hotel Empress in a hurry and lose that cab behind us. Okay, lady, this is the Empress. We shook that other cab. I headed toward the entrance. Just as I entered, I caught a quick glimpse of a cab pulling up to the curb, but I couldn't stop to see. I rushed into the hotel, up to my room, and locked myself in. Before I even had time to think, the phone rang. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Cross. I just sent a gentleman up to see you. I banged the receiver down. So it was Bucky in that cab. I had to get out. There was only one elevator and I couldn't try the stairs because I didn't know which Bucky would use. I had only one way out, the desperate way, and I decided to take it. I unlocked the door. I turned off the lights. And I took a pair of scissors from my handbag and waited behind the door. I wasn't a moment too soon. Come in. I pressed against the wall behind the door and watched it open slowly. Then leaping forward, I plunged the scissors into his back. Oh, oh. oh. that is... It's me, Stephen. Stephen! You said you were coming at night. I... What? I left earlier to surprise you. Why didn't you phone? I did. You haven't arrived yet. Uh, oh, Stephen. Stephen. He's dead. Hello, baby. Bucky. Surprised to see me, huh? Hey, who's that? 
Steve Bromley. You done him in. Nice work, baby, but why the chase? I, I, I had to run. I... I understand. The screw was following you. Thought you'd lead him to me. Yes. yes. Sure, well, you did right, baby, but... Let's get out of here. No. You've got no choice. Come Let on. Let go of me. Shut up. You'll have the whole hotel on that. Let go of me. Come on, baby. You're on break. Get away from me. Come on. What's going get... on in here? The house takes holding. I'm getting out of here. There we are, both of you. Looks like that guy on the floor. You ain't going anywhere for a long time. Let's see you. Here. Reach, chum. This ain't no toy. Neither is. Oh, my okay. hand. Now, let's get going. There isn't much more to tell. You were at the trial, you know the rest. I'm back at Moore Prison for good. There's a real prisoner this time. And Bucky, he's got a few hours before they take him to the chair. Mrs. Cross? What is it? Bucky Briggs is just outside the cell. He's due to go in 15 minutes. Wants to talk to you before he goes. To me? Yes. All right. Doesn't matter anymore. Briggs, it's okay. Five minutes, Bucky. And we're just outside. Hello, baby. I don't have anything to say to you. Yeah, but I got something I want to ask you before I go. It's bothered me ever since I was nabbed. All right, ask it. Why didn't you leave when I asked you to back in that hotel room? Why? <laughs> You're laughing about. As if you didn't know. No what? If I went with you, I knew it was the end for me. What are you talking about? You wanted to kill me. Me kill you? How do you figure that? Oh, out? stop acting, Bucky. It doesn't make any difference now. All right, so I double-crossed you the night you escaped. I called the tower exactly two minutes after you left. You what? So that's how they picked me up so fast. I thought you knew. What a sap I... And what a sucky! You dirty double crusher! Bucky, keep away! Help! Double crusher! Help! Throat! Double crusher! Get your hands! I'll break your neck! Help! Better go, Briggs, or I'll shoot! You're too late, screw! You. She. She's dead. You broke her neck. It don't make no difference now. Can't kill me twice. Now, there's a nice, gentle character, that Bucky. Just a little too restless with his hands. You know, here and now, I'm starting a new movement for Inner Sanctum Mysteries. From now on, our slogan should be, when you grab a throat, stop and think, then stroke. Don't choke. <laughs> that should start our characters being more considerate, don't you think, Mary? Well, if you want folks to be more considerate of others, Mr. Host, first you've got to put them in a relaxed and happy mood themselves. And how do you go about doing that? Well, one of the best ways I know is to set a cup of Lipton tea in front of them. There's nothing like Lipton's to give a person a relaxed, happy feeling, you know. Put you in a good mood for loving the world. Because Lipton's wonderful, brisk flavor is so extra enjoyable and satisfying. That's why it's a good thing never to be without Lipton tea. So, take this as a gentle reminder, folks. Jot down the name Lipton tea on your tomorrow's grocery list right now. Buy it. Try it. You're sure to enjoy it because Lipton tea has brisk flavor. <laughs> Before we say goodnight, friends, here's an epitaph for the tombstone of Gladys Cross. Here lies a good heart rent asunder by a man with a soul full of thunder. Her sweetheart named Stephen tried to help her get even. Now they all live in peace six feet under. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is I Hate Blondes by Wolf Kaufman. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups will bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown and starring the famous Broadway and Hollywood star, 
Orson Welles in The Lonely Heart's Killer. Or how to keep a heart from being lonely in one quick slip. <laughs> I'll be listening for Orson Welles in next week's Inner Sanctum story. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Meal getters, is your time precious? Then you'll find time saving Lipton's noodle soup mix is, is a big help. You prepare it in just a very few minutes, and it's a sure winner with the family. For Lipton's noodle soup is a grand flavored, real chickeny tasting broth, chock full of tempting, tender noodles. And it's economical, makes lots more, yet it costs less than ordinary canned soups. So don't forget to ask your grocer for Lipton's noodle soup mix tomorrow. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. As it aired at 9 o'clock Eastern Time on CBS, Inner Sanctum Mysteries. We'll take a look at the news of that day, and then we'll roll it back an hour to 8 o'clock Eastern Time for an episode of the Mutual Program, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Uh, Mr. Lamb, need help packing those boxes? Yeah, almost done, Katie. That was some retirement party. You got big plans? Yep. Now that we're 65, the wife and I will get extra $1,000 exemptions. We may qualify for the credit for the elderly, and we may sell our house. See, there's a tax break on the sale of a home when you're 55 or older. Guess it pays to be old. <laughs> Who's old? <laughs> Use the order form in your tax package to get free IRS publication 554, Tax Benefits for Older Americans. Message from the IRS. And on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we're listening now to a pair of shows from April 9th, 1946. We just heard Inner Sanctum Mysteries. In a few moments, we'll hear Nick Carter, Master Detective, a quick look at news from the newspapers of that Tuesday, April 9th, 1946, 78 years ago. A conference of big four foreign ministers in Paris late this month to speed final peace settlements with Germany's former European allies seemed virtually assured last night. Secretary of State Burns told a news conference that Russia and Britain already had agreed to his proposal for such a meeting to begin April 25th. France has not yet replied. French embassy officials assured a reporter, however, that the delays were mechanical. A $253 million fund to get temporary housing for veterans cleared Congress yesterday while the Senate debated the administration's plan to spend $600 million on building material subsidies. The Senate laid aside the latter measure temporarily to pass the $253 million appropriation and send it to President Truman. It's intended to provide 102,000 temporary homes for veterans and their families by remodeling wartime barracks and temporary housing. A new direct clash between the United States and Russia was threatened imminently last night when Secretary of State James F. Burns indicated that he definitely opposed a Russian demand that the United Nations Security Council take the Iranian question off its program. Council delegates working out their policy toward Russia's demand, which, if accepted, would be a confession that the country violated the U.N. charter by merely discussing Iran when Burns said in Washington that this country stood pat on its position. The United States will assemble 29 fighting ships for full-scale war games beginning this month in the Atlantic. Two giant carriers and a super battleship will be included in the vessels to participate in the exercises scheduled to last five weeks. The strange case of white-haired Alfred Leonard Klein and of the several elderly women who wed him and then died mysteriously brought into San Francisco court yesterday as the 56-year-old ex-convict went to trial on charges of forgery and grand theft. He's specifically charged with forging deeds and bonds of two former wives, Mrs. Dolores Krebs Klein of Chicago, who left an estate of $323,000, and Mrs. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hunt Lewis Klein of Oakland, who also left considerable property. 
As he spoke to prospective jurors yesterday, Klein's attorney said an attempt will be made to introduce evidence of mass murder, regardless of whether this testimony means anything or not. Ferdinand Thun and Henry Jansen, who came to America from Germany in 1892 with less than $100 between them, recently celebrated their 80th birthdays with a gift of $1 million to the Reading, Pennsylvania Hospital. Thune and Jansen, partners in the Berkshire Knitting Mills, largest in the world, they previously donated $3.6 million to the hospital. That's some of the day's news as it was in the newspapers of Tuesday, April 9th, 1946. On your radio coming up next, Nick Carter, Master Detective. This is Lauren Green with a message from the U.S. Customs Service. Everyone who travels out of the country must complete a declaration form when returning through customs. To save time and trouble, write for a free kit of useful material that the U.S. Customs Service has put together to help you, especially when you get ready to bring yourself and your foreign purchases back to the United States. The kit includes a declaration form that you fill out while you shop for gifts and souvenirs. A great way of keeping tabs on your foreign purchases while you make them. So, before you leave the country, get your free travel pack of information. Write Travel Pack, U.S. Customs Service, Washington, D.C., 20229. That's Travel Pack, U.S. Customs Service, Washington, D.C., 20229. Or ask your local travel agent for a free travel pack of information. You'll never find a better travel kit than your free travel pack. And now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we close out our visit to Tuesday, April 9th, 1946, with an episode of Nick Carter, Master Detective, as it was broadcast at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 78 years ago today, April 9th, 1946, in the case of the disappearing corpse. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. My safe, you thief! Give me! Oh. Oh. A thunderstorm rages outside. A shot. A man falls dead. So begins a strange adventure for Nick Carter, master detective. An adventure in which a murder seemed to be no murder at all, and the dead body vanished into thin air. The Case of the Disappearing Corpse. Good morning, Matty. Oh, how are you, Nick? What brings you down here to headquarters so early in the morning? It's only just 10 o'clock. Well, I've been out in the country for the past couple of weeks writing an article on crime detection methods. Finished it last night. Huh? Just stopped in on my way back to my office past the time of day. That's what's doing. Yeah, it's pretty quiet, Nick. Nothing exciting's happened in the past ten days. Oh, Matty, haven't you even got one simple little murder just to keep me in practice? I'm bored. Uh, well, would you be interested in checking up on a suicide? Now, what's there to investigate about a suicide? Well, you never can tell, Nick. I just got a report that a guy bumped himself off in an uptown apartment house. I was going up to take a look at it myself, but the commissioner just called and must see him in his office right away. Uh, you want to go up in my place? 
Oh, I don't know, Matty. Well, if it's just the usual routine, you can lay off after you make the call. Anybody else going up? Medical examiners going along? Well, I called my office a few minutes ago, and Patsy had nothing for me, so I might as well run up and see what it's all about. What's the address? Hmm? No, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, yeah, it's uh, 717 West Hampton Street, apartment 4. Okay, Matty. See you when we get back. West Hampton Street. What was that number, Doc? 717. Ought to be just ahead, Nick. Oh, yeah. 695, 701, 709. There it is. Yeah. 717. Well, that's a pretty swanky place, Nick. You can't live here on a white collar salary. <clears throat> oh, here's the elevator. Waiting for us. Apartment 4, wasn't it? Yeah. Get in and push the button. <clears throat> ah, here's Cor right across the hall here. Yes, sir? Police department. You report a suicide? Oh, yes, sir. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. He... The body's right in the living room there, to your left. Oh, yes. I see it. Well, doesn't seem to be much of a question about its being suicide. You're the butler? Yes, sir. My name is Jordan. What do you know about this, Jordan? Very little, sir. Mr. Warner, he's Mr. Miller's nephew, came in about an hour ago and found his uncle lying there in the middle of the floor. I hadn't come down, but he called me and I reported it to the police. I've touched nothing since. Where's Mr. Warner now? Is he here? Yes, sir. He's upstairs in the library. He'll be down in a moment. I see. This dead man? Mr. Miller? Yes, sir. Mr. Anthony Miller. This is his apartment. His niece and I live here with him. Where's his niece now? She's dressing, sir. She'll be down with you shortly. This is a duplex apartment, isn't it? Yes, sir. Reception hall, living room, dining room, and kitchen on this floor. Library and three bedrooms on the second floor. Oh, pretty swank, I'd say. Pretty stuffy, I'd say. Well, thank you, Jordan. Well, as soon as the others come down, bring them in here, will you? Yes, at once, sir. Well, Doc, how's it look? Oh, pretty cut and dried. Pistol in his hand, a hole in his head with powder stains around it. Uh, looks like suicide, all right. How long has he been dead? Must have been killed about uh, three o'clock. Uh, beg your pardon, sir. Here's Mr. Warner, Mr. Miller's nephew. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Warner? I'm Nick Carter. Uh, Nick Carter? Yes. I'm acting for Sergeant Matheson of the Metropolitan Police. Oh, by the way, Jordan, yes. I left word for my two assistants to meet me here as soon as they could. When they arrive, will you let me know, please? Of course, at once, sir. Mr. Warner, I understand you found your uncle's body. That's right, Mr. Carter, I did. Will you tell us about it? Well, of course. When I was here last week, I left my camera here. I wanted to take some pictures this morning, so I dropped in here about 9.30 to pick it up. Who let you in? No one, Mr. Carter. I have my own key to the apartment. I came into the living room here, saw my uncle lying there on the floor obviously dead. So I called Jordan, who came down immediately and phoned the police. That's about all. Was the outer apartment door locked when you came in? Yes. Both the regular safety lock and the regular lock were on. Mm-hmm. Are there any windows opening under the fire escapes? They were all fastened securely, sir. I checked them myself to make sure. Then no one could have come in from the outside? No, hardly. Not with the door and windows all locked as they were. I uh, see. Mr. Carter, what's the idea of all these questions? It was suicide, wasn't it? Just purely routine, that's all. Has anything in this room been touched since the body was found? No, nothing. Good. That your uncle's pistol in his hand? It uh, looks like it, yes. Yeah, let me take it over. There. You recognize it? Well, no, don't touch it. There may be fingerprints on it. That's why I'm holding it with my handkerchief. Yes. Yes, that's my Uncle Gun, all right. There's no question about that. Yes, sir, it's Mr. Miller's gun, Mr. Carter. I, I've seen it often. Mm-hmm. And one of the shells is empty. And one shot has been fired. Well, that's all it took to kill him. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, what is it? This is unusual, to say the least. There's an empty shell in the chamber, but the pistol barrel is clean. What's that, Nick? You see? Either the barrel has been cleaned since the shot was fired, or the shot wasn't fired from this gun. Then this can't be suicide. Can't be suicide? No. It's definitely not suicide. It's murder. Murder, sir? But Where's oh. the old man's niece? Say she lives here? Yes, sir. She... 
She began to wreck sir. Mr. Carter, she knows nothing about this. She was still asleep when we phoned the police. Jordan called her afterward. That's right, sir. I did. She knows nothing of this. Maybe and maybe not. I'd like to talk to her anyway, because from what you tell me about the door and windows all being locked, and from the condition of the murder weapon, this must have been an inside job. One of you three is guilty. Well, now look here, Mr. Carter. Sorry, I wasn't... Mr. Warner. This is now in the hands of the police. May I use your phone, please? There's one on the desk, sir. Oh, that, that one's not working, Mr. Carter. If you... Come with me. I'll show you the one in the library upstairs. Right. I, I know that one's all right. This this one has a, a short circuit or something. Thanks. Be right back, Doc. Right, Nick. Sorry to trouble you. No, no, not at all. You better call Sergeant Matheson. Have him send his homicide experts up here as well as the cop to stand guard. Well, you probably want you all to go down to headquarters for a talk. I see. Murder has to be treated very differently from suicide. Yeah. Well, there's the library right ahead of you. You'll find the phone in there. Thanks. It's a fortune to live here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, this is apartment four, Patsy. Right here. Uh huh. Yes. What is it, please? Is Mr. Carter here? Mr. Carter? Yes, Mr. Nick Carter, the detective. You must have the wrong number, Miss. What number were you looking for? Look, is this seven seventeen West Hampton Street, or isn't it? That's correct, sir. And is this apartment four, or isn't it? That's quite right, sir. Okay, then where's Nick Carter? I'm very sorry, sir, but there must be some mistake. Mr. Anthony Miller lives here. There's no Mr. Carter. Well, didn't a man kill himself here last night? Oh, my goodness, no, miss. You're all mixed up. Well, uh, Scubby, did Sergeant Matheson tell you the name of the dead man? No, said whoever phoned didn't give it to him. Oh, we must have the address wrong, Patsy. Maybe. Uh, could, could we use your phone? Why, of course, miss, if you'll step into the living room... That's your left. There's a phone in there. Oh, thanks. Come on, Scabby. You okay. can give the sergeant a buzz and see what's wrong. Right there, sir, on the desk. Right on. Thanks. If you'll pardon me for a moment, please. Well, sure. Go ahead. Police headquarters. Uh, let me speak to Sergeant Matheson. One moment, please. Oh, I wonder how it would be to live in a place. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, Maddie, this is Scubby. Yeah, what's on your mind, Scubby? Oh, Nick must have given us the wrong address when he told us to follow him uptown to this suicide place. What is the address? Uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, yeah. Here it is. It's 717 West Hampton Street, apartment 4. But that's where we are, Maddie. And they don't know anything about it here. What's that? No, the butler tells us there's been no suicide here. What? Uh, hey, that's the address they gave us this morning when they phoned. Well, have you heard from Nick or the medical examiner? Hey, come to think of it, I have it. And that's a funny thing, too. It's over two hours since they left here. They ought to be back by now. Hey, why didn't they call and say they got the wrong address? There's something mighty funny going on, Scubby. Yeah, looks like it. Well, we'll see what we can find. Maybe it's an address that sounds like this one. We'll call you in a little while if we don't find anything. Okay, I'll tell the boys to watch out for Nick and Doc. Right, so long. You know any more than we do? No. He hasn't heard from Nick or the doc since they left headquarters about two hours ago. What are you looking at? I was just thinking. Whoever lives here has pretty poor taste, even if they do have money. How do you mean? Well, look at the rug in this room. Yeah? It's the wrong color. It's definitely too small for the size of the floor. And the rug in the next room, which must be the dining room. But it's entirely the wrong color for the decorative effect in that room. And that one's much too big for the size of the floor. Yeah, you're right, Patsy. It's funny that people who live in such swell places should furnish their rooms so badly. Yeah. It almost looks as if these two rugs have been switched around, doesn't it? Patsy, maybe that's just what did happen. Maybe... I... Here, let me get a look at the rug under that dining table. Uh-huh. I'll shove the table over to one side and have a good look. Okay. Are you, are you looking for something, uh, sir? You're darn right I'm looking for something. You better hope I don't find it. I have to ask you to stop moving that dining table. If you try to stop me, I'll put a gun between your ribs. I'll call the police. Go ahead, call him if you dare. There. Gabby, look, right in the center of the rug, a big blood stain. That's what I thought. 
And I'll bet my last dollar that you'll find a blood stain that same size and shape in the center of the living room floor. Then someone was killed here. Yes, Patsy. And Nick and the doctor were here, too. This whole business about there being no killing here is a frame-up. Now you talk. And talk fast. What have you done with Nick Carter? <laughs> Every man in every squad car is to be on the lookout for him. Now repeat that description I gave you. Right. Right. No, 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 it's Gerald Warner. Yeah, he was the old man's nephew. Okay, let me know as soon as you hear anything. Now, Jordan, look here. You're in a pretty tight spot. If you don't want this murder rap pinned on you, you better talk and you better say plenty. But I tell you, I know nothing about it. And you still say you don't know where the old man's niece went either, huh? Miss, Miss Hammond? No, sir. She put on her hat and coat and went out carrying a small overnight bag. Where'd she go? I don't know, sir. Ah, look, don't be a sap. The butler always knows everything about a killing. And most of the time, the butler done the murder himself. But I assure now, you, look, sir, I... we've proved that the bloodstained scubby and Patsy found was human blood. We found Nick Carter's fingerprints on the desk, the table, and the upstairs phone. We found the old man's body stuffed in that upstairs closet in your apartment. <laughs> and you don't know nothing about nothing. Oh, Sergeant, here's huh? the bullet they just took out of Miller's body. Let me see it. Ah, well, that's an ordinary thirty-two caliber slug. Yeah, but it was big enough to kill him. I know that. What I mean was... Sergeant, your detective squad is back from searching Gerald Warner's apartment. Oh, yeah? They find anything? Mm, Nothing very valuable. Oh, they did find a telephone number for the niece, Frances Hammond. Uh Uh-oh. There were two numbers in Warner's small directory. One was her home, and the other, according to the chief operator, is at 62 East Pine Street. Now, what the deuce would that be? Well, maybe she's got a girlfriend there. That's it, Scubby. Patsy, this is a job for you. Uh-huh. Go to this address and see if Frances Hammond is there. If she is, tell her you're a reporter. Find out how much she knows. Get as much of the story out of her as you can. And if she's not there? All right, maybe you can find out where she is. But go on, get going and hurry. Right. Maybe you can dig up something that'll tell us where Nick is. <laughs> Any idea where we are, Doc? No. Looks sort of like somebody's hunting shack. Yes, I can see that. That doesn't help much. Well, as long as we're tied up to these two chairs like we are, it doesn't make much difference what part of the world we're in. We're no good to anybody this way. Oh, the thing that makes me maddest is the way they fooled me so completely. I never did see who hit me. Well, considering that there were only two men in the place and that the butler was with me, it isn't very hard to figure out who tapped you for the count. I was out cold from the time I was knocked out until I came to in this place. My wrist was so relaxed when they tied me that I can't work them loose. No, don't think I got into this mess because I was bored. <laughs> I don't understand how you found out where I was staying, Miss Bowen. Your cousin told me, Miss Hammond. But it was he who suggested that I come here. He knew reporters would be pestering me for interviews after... after Uncle Anthony killed himself. And he said if I came here, they wouldn't be able to find me. He promised me he wouldn't tell anyone. But he only gave me your address because he knew I wouldn't pester you. He and I have been friends for years. Oh, I... hope he doesn't tell anyone else. I'm sure he won't. And now... May I ask you a question or two? I suppose so. I I really don't feel much like talking about it. I know, Miss Hammond. You loved your uncle, didn't you? Very much. He was always so good to me. Were you and your cousin engaged? Well, not quite. Uncle wanted us to get married. In fact, he he made a will leaving me all his money because, well, he, he thought that would keep Gerald more interested in me. Was Gerald, uh, Mr. Warner... Interested in anyone else? Oh, no, it wasn't that. Uncle Anthony knew that Joe wasn't ready to settle down yet. He was trying to persuade him it would be the best thing for him. Do you know where your cousin is now? I No, I don't. Why do you ask me where he is? Don't you know? Well, uh, wait, wait, you see, he um, asked me to send him a copy of whatever I wrote in my interview with you. But he's left town and he didn't leave me his address. Can you tell me? Why, well, I don't know. When he wants to get out of town, he generally goes to Atlantic City, the Hotel Martise, or to his hunting shack up in Norris County. He might be in either place, I suppose. Uh Uh-huh. 
Well, I'll send a copy of the interview to each of these addresses. One of them ought to reach him. Uh, tell me, Miss Hammond, did you know where your uncle kept his pistol? Why, of course. We all knew it. It was no secret. I've seen it often. But I... I never thought he'd use it to... to do this. Oh, there now, Miss Hammond. I'm sorry I mentioned it. Oh, please don't let it upset you. I'll just run along now. Goodbye. And thanks. <laughs> Trying to get across the room by moving your chair like this when you're tied up in it this way isn't the simplest thing in the world. Well, I, I can't make my chair move at all. But you're doing fine. Am I getting anywhere near that table yet? You're doing great, Nick. Just a little more. I'm moving backwards this way. It's hard to tell where I'm going. Uh, to your left. Uh, just a hair. That, that, that's it. Now you got it. Uh, so far, so good. Now... Just where's the bottle, Doc? With my back to it this way, I can't see where it is. It's almost directly in back of you, uh, about a foot from the edge of the table. All right. I'll pull the tablecloth toward me, and that'll bring the bottle near the edge where I can get hold of it. Watch it while I pull it now. Is it coming? Uh, careful now. It's almost there. Hold it. It's right at the edge. You ought to be able to get it now. Well, I can if I can get my hands up that high. Whoever tied my arms and back of this chair did too good a job. There's no slack at all. Uh, that's it. There. I got it. <sighs> now, if I can break this bottle against the fireplace, I should have a sharp edge that'll cut these ropes in short order. <clears throat> but when you can only move an inch at a time this way, it's slow work getting anywhere. <clears throat> Keep me going in the right direction, Doc. Oh, you're doing fine, Nick. Only a little more now. Uh, uh, to your left a bit. Now, that's it. You ought to be able to reach it now. Uh, uh, I'll try it. Easy first. Uh, you can hit it all right. Yeah. All right, here goes, Doc. Uh, you did it, Nick. Now edge your chair over toward me. You can cut my ropes first, then I'll cut yours. Gosh, Nick... You're the eighth wonder of the world. Thanks, Doc. Well, look out. Here I come. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, yeah, Chief. You say Gerald Warner isn't at the Hotel Martis and hasn't been there for several months, huh? Okay, thanks very much, Chief. Yeah, that's what we wanted to know. We know where to look for him now. Yeah, thanks. So long. Well, that wasn't so bad, Nick. But it took longer to cut through the ropes of that piece of glass than I thought it would. Well, we're free, and that's the main thing. Have you found anything around the shack here that looks like a clue? I'm not sure, Doc, but I rather think so. I found these two pistols in the back of one of the cupboards. They're very unusual pair of guns. Uh -huh. Oh, here. This gun has one empty shell on it. The barrel is clean. It has not been fired. Well, that's the gun that was in the old man's hand when we found him, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it is. Now, look at this other gun. Uh -huh. This one has no empty shells in it. The barrel is dirty, and from the smell of it has been fired very recently. I see what you mean. Say, that does make them a little queer, doesn't it? Well, Doc, as I see it, Warner killed Miller with his own gun. Then he tried to make it look like suicide, but he couldn't leave his own gun there. So he got his uncle's gun, which hadn't been fired, took the empty shell out of his gun and exchanged it for a full shell from his uncle's gun and put that gun in his uncle's hand. And he was just excited enough not to realize that the barrel of his uncle's gun was still clean. Of course. But, well, why didn't he fire the other gun instead of going through all that rigmarole about changing the empty shell for the full one? Probably afraid that a second shot would wake up somebody who might have been partly aroused by the first shot. The one that killed his uncle. Well, I have to admit that it makes sense the way you tell it. And you still think that it will pay us to wait here for somebody to show up? Yes, Doc, I do. Because if anyone was planning to get rid of us, they'd have done it tonight. And they'd have to do it tonight. They wouldn't dare wait until tomorrow. Someone might find us in the meantime. So if we wait, someone is sure to show up. Okay, you're the doctor. As far as catching murderers goes, you say wait, we wait. <laughs> You 
right, Nick. There's somebody now. Now, remember, sit in your chair with your back to the door. Hold the ropes as if he was still tied up and unconscious. Like this? Let your head drop on your chest more. Right. Now, that's swell, Doc. Mm. Now, you look as if he were dead to the world. I'll do the same. Quiet. Here they are. Oh, what do you know? It's still out cold. I must have given him a stiffer dose than I thought I did. Ah, it won't hurt him. Makes it easier for us. Yeah, you're quite right, Mike. What are we going to do next, Warner? I still think our best plan is to dump them in the old quarry. It's close by and it's full of water. We'll wait the bodies. They'll never be found. Yeah, that's an awful lot of killing just to get a hold of an old will. Not at all, Mike. If I could have taken the will without killing anyone, I would have been glad to do it that way. But since I couldn't, I'm not going to worry about it. And it's worth every bit of my trouble, believe me. The will I destroyed left everything to my cousin. Now that that's out of the way, I am the old man's only living relative. Sole heir to everything he owns. And that's plenty. Uh, what about that niece of his, your cousin? Ah, but she's not really his niece. She's just a girl he sort of unofficially adopted. He always planned to adopt her legally, but he... Well, never got around to it, so... She gets nothing. You gonna marry her? Marry her? Mm. <laughs> oh, no, indeed, Mike. She's not my type at all. I just kidded around with her to keep in right with the old man. But that's all over now. Well, I hope it works out like you wanted to. Well, I've certainly had bad breaks so far. First, the old man catches me at the safe. Then headquarters sends up Nick Carter instead of a regular cop. Then with a the butler and... And the plan that I had the apartment all fixed up so you'd never know there'd been a killing, Carter's two assistants show up. And the girl notices the rugs have been switched. That tips off the whole frame-up. Ah, uh, your troubles are over now. They will be as soon as we get rid of these two middlers. Yeah, uh, better do it pretty quick now. Uh, take it easy, just as soon as it gets a little darker, Mike. Ah, uh, uh, you got any old burlap bags we can put them in? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's some out back. I'll show you where they are. Okay, better have them ready when we want them. How was that chance, Doc? Come on. Let me have one of those shotguns we loaded before. Here you are, Nick. Thanks. Now you take the other one. Get behind the cupboard there. I'll hide over here. Right, Nick. You say when. Let me do the talking. Be quiet now. Mike! Mike, look, they've gone! That ain't possible. I just... Get oh. your hands up high. Ed? Both of you. Carter! How did you... We'll talk about that later. All right, Doc. I'll load the gun on them while you tie their hands and tie them tight the way they tied ours. It'll be a pleasure, Nick, a positive pleasure. Oh, wait till I tie them. Well, Mr. Out. Warner, this isn't coming out just the way you planned it, is it? You've got no proof against me, Carter. You're wrong, Warner. When you knocked me out in your uncle's apartment, you proved you killed him. Tell that to a jury and see how far you get. Oh, that's not legal evidence. It's true. But I have some other evidence that is legal. Why? Warner, between the time Doc and I got free and the time you and Mike got here, we searched this shack of yours. And hidden in one of the cupboards, we found these two guns. Well, so you found two guns in a hunting shack. That's really remarkable. One of these guns is the one that was in your uncle's hand when I first saw his body. The other one, I feel sure, is the one that actually killed him. And if I'm not mistaken, it'll be registered in your name, have your fingerprints on it, and will fire a bullet that'll match the bullet that killed your uncle. Would you call those things legal proof? All right, all right. Yes, that's the gun I killed him with. You know, Carter, I should have killed you when I had the chance. Yes, it would have been wiser than to... Nick? Nick, are you there? Nick, Nick! Come in, Patsy. Oh. What's all the excitement? Oh, then, Nick, I've been so afraid. Afraid of what? Af afraid for you. Why, Patsy, why, I... you should know me better than that. Say, so how did you get down here anyway? Well, when Sergeant Matheson got word from Atlantic City that Warner wasn't there, why, I, I made Scubby drive me down here as fast as he could. Yeah, she wouldn't let me stop and park anywhere. I never have any luck when I'm out with her. Well, you got here just in time to drive back with us. I was just going to take Mr. Warner and his friend here back to town to meet Mattie. Oh, gosh, Nick. After that, that thug tried to tell me that you'd never been in the apartment when we knew you had, why... Oh, I was ready for anything. But she got even with him. I sure <laughs> did. He thought I wouldn't notice that they'd switch the rugs around, but I did. <laughs> That'll teach him. Yes, Patsy. This is one time when a woman's instinct for interior decoration really solved a murder. Well, Nick, how 
how about a glimpse into next week's story of intrigue and adventure? You used the right word that time, Ken. Because next week I'm going to tell you a story in which intrigue is the keynote. A man in the death house with only nine hours to live asked me to prove him innocent of the charge in which he'd been convicted. He claimed he was the victim of a frame-up. And when Nick really got into the case, he found that the whole thing was a frame-up, but not quite the way we expected. You mean you investigated the case and found a solution in only nine hours? That's right, Ken. They were a very busy nine hours, and a man's life hung in the balance. What do you call your story, Nick? I call it Nine Hours to Live. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In The Adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. From 78 years ago, April 9, 1946, uh, Nick Carter, Master Detective. And finally, we'll move back to 1941 in just a moment as we hear the adventures of Superman. Friends, this is Bob Hope. If an atom bomb were to hit your home city, would you know what to do? Remember, one explosion of an atom bomb could kill 75,000 and maim 100,000. This is only one kind of a disaster which could strike. In addition to many forms of enemy action, there are the dangers of fire, flood, earthquake, and traffic. Knowing what to do before, during, and after a disaster can improve your chances of survival. There is something you can do and do now. You can learn a pattern of survival. Your local office of civil defense is ready to help. Persuade your club, your church, your friends, and your neighbors to help to learn to live. Remember, this is the atomic age. No one can escape its hazards, but everyone can prepare. Listen carefully. What you are about to hear can save your life. Do you know the siren signal in case of atomic attack? Do you know how to find shelter? Do you know how to give first aid? Do you know what will be done for your safety? For further details, consult your local office of civil defense. And now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, another episode of Superman. This one from 83 years ago today, April 9th, 1941, the ongoing story of the last of the Clipper ships and the Whistler on the ship. Not our Whistler, a different one. Presenting the transcription feature, Superman! <laughs> And now, Superman, strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, star reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle against crime and injustice. Shrouded in fog, the Clara M., last of the old clipper ships, moves slowly southward toward Panama with Clark Kent and young Jimmy Olsen aboard. For some time now, ever since the Clara M. left port, the crew have been terrified by the Whistler, said to be the spirit of a whistling seaman lost overboard many years ago. In our last episode, we heard how Pug Flanagan, a stowaway of about Jimmy's age, confessed that he had impersonated the Whistler, but maintained that he was not the real Whistler. Just then, the strange, eerie whistle was heard through the fog, and as our friends realized that Pug was telling the truth. On deck, Kent and Jimmy traced the strange whistle to the bow of the ship, and suddenly... Wait. Listen. This time.
time, Jim, the whistler can't get away from us unless he jumps overboard. The ship's too narrow at this point for anything to get past us. Gosh, my heart's pounding like a trip hammer. When the battle starts, let me handle it. Are you all set? Uh, I guess so. All right, then. Quiet. Now. Gosh, Mr. Kent. He, he can't be more than five or six feet ahead of us. Yes. Hmm. Fog seems to have thickened again. Hard to see through it. But come on. Easy now, Jim. If anything's going to happen, it'll happen in the next few seconds. Don't worry about me. Gosh, that whistle is... We... What is it? Jim, we... We can't go another step. We're right up in the very tip of the bow. I can almost reach out and touch the figurehead. Yes, there's... Nothing here. That's right. Not a sign of anyone. I don't suppose... Oh, gosh, Mr. Kent. Now, take it easy, Jim. Take it easy. The business about it being a spirit is seafaring nonsense. There's some explanation for this strange thing, and we've got to find out what it is. Maybe it isn't the spirit. But with this fog swirling around us and the whistler disappearing right in front of us... Well, we didn't actually see him, Jim. No, but we heard him. There it is again. Right on top of us, Mr. Kent. Easy does it. Jim, that whistle came from right in front of me. There's nothing there. Nothing but the figurehead. Wooden carving of a woman with her hair flying in the wind. Exactly, Jim. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's the matter, Mr. Kent? I'm not sure, but... Jim, you stay here. While I work my way out onto that figurehead. Gosh, be careful, Mr. Kent. If you ever fell over... Don't right? worry. I won't. There it is again. Yes, and this time I'm closer to it. Sir, we're on the right track now, Jim. Mr. Kent, have you found anything? Mr. Kent! Mr. Kent! Oh, gosh. All right, Jim. Oh. I didn't want to ask you before I heard the whistle again. I was right. The mystery solved. Oh, good night. What is it? Uh, will I get back on deck? Yeah. Well, what was it, Mr. Kent? What did you find? Jim, you'd never believe it. But there's a set of wooden pipes, like the pipes on an organ set into that figurehead. Wooden pipes? Exactly. Very cleverly set into the figurehead, so that when the wind blows in a certain direction, it plays that little tune on the pipes. Well, I'll be... Hey, listen. Gosh. <laughs> you know, it sounds kind of pleasant, now that I know what it is. Of course it does. Whoever had those pipes built into the ship or why, I'm afraid we'll never know. But there's no question about it, that's how the legend of the whistler started. Oh, you could knock me over with a feather. <laughs> All the time we thought it was a, well, a spirit. <laughs> And our stowaway friend, Pug Flanagan, made very good use of it, too. Hey, which reminds me, we'd better look for Barnaby and Pug and tell them what we've discovered. Yeah, they ought to be coming up on the other side of the deck by this time. Boy, will they be surprised. Yeah, not to mention the crew. They'll certainly be glad to know the truth about the whistler. Yeah, but still, it doesn't solve our other problem, does it, Jim? Oh, you mean about Barnaby planning to take the ship by force? Yes. Yeah. Say, uh, when we come up with Barnaby and Pug, don't let on that you've told me anything. We know he's looking for something aboard the Clara M, Jim, but we can't show our hand until we discover exactly what it is he wants. Oh, whatever it is, it sure must be valuable. Don't forget, he bribed the crew with money out of his own pocket to sign on board the Clara M. It must have cost plenty. Yeah, you're right. Yes, whatever Barnaby's after must have great value. It's all the more reason for us to keep quiet until we find out what it is. I guess you're right. All I can say is... Wait. What's that? It's 
Sounds like Barnaby up ahead. Yeah, he must be talking to Pug. Boy, wait till they hear. Wait a minute, Jim. Huh? Listen. What's that Barnaby saying? What? Hey, Shh, quiet, listen. I wanted to know me to light on fire. Heaven, I'll lash you within an inch of your life. I tell you, I don't know nothing. See nothing. Now, let me go. You start away in that secret compartment for a week, didn't you? Yes, sure. Gee, Mr. Kent, what? Quiet, Jim. Let's hear this. Uh, you mean to say there wasn't nothing in that secret compartment? Nothing at all. That's what I said, pal. And if you don't like it, you can lump it. Yeah. Hey, 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 you're breaking my arm. Well, that's just the beginning. You see this? Oh, a knife, huh? Okay, what do you want? Mr. Kent, don't you think we better... Don't worry, don't worry, Jim. He wouldn't dare hurt him. Well, just either you tell me what was in that secret compartment next to Jimmy Olsen's cabin, or you start saying your prayers if you know any. I'm telling you, there wasn't nothing in that closet. Nothing except... Well, yeah, there was something. Ah, I thought you'd be singing a different tune before long. What was that? Just an old piece of oil silk. I used it to wrap up any food I wanted to save. And that's all, to help me. There wasn't nothing else in the closet. That's all, you say? Yeah. <laughs> that's enough. Where's that piece of oil silk now? I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. I remember now. That reporter guy, Clark Chet, got it. Kent's got it, eh? Yeah. Well, we'll just have to... Have you got it, Mr. Kent? Why, uh, yes, Jim. It's right here in my coat pocket. The way Barnaby's talking, it sounds pretty important. Yeah, it sounds very important, Jim. Come on. Well, are we going to talk to Barnaby and tell him about the whistler? No, well, that can wait. Right now, we're going down to the privacy of my cabin. But what for? Why do you... To find out, Jim, just how important this piece of oiled silk really is. Come on. I'll light the oil lamp, Mr. Kent. All right, Jim. There we are. Good. All right, now, suppose you pull a chair up to the table here. Mm Mm-hmm. All set? Now then, we'll just open this oil silk. Gee. Well, for the... A piece of roast chicken. (laughs) Pug must have been saving it. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not interested in what's inside the silk, Jim, but what's on it? Oh, what could be on it? I don't know. That's what I want to find out. Yeah, it's pretty dirty. Must have been on the floor of that secret compartment for years. Hey, Jim. Yeah? Uh, take that towel and dip it in that basin of water and bring it here to the table, will you? Uh, better bring basin and all. Want to try and wash the dirt off? Yep. We'll have to be careful, too. You don't want to wash off whatever else may be on the silk. What, what do you think could be on it? Well, that's hard to say, Jim. But whatever it is, Barnaby's anxious to get his hands on it. Here's the wet cloth. Oh, yeah, good. Now, let's just see if we can get this dirt off. That oiled silk is pretty much all dried out. Mm. Like a piece of old parchment. Yes, and the dust has worked itself into the fibers. If we're careful enough, we may be able to make something out of this. Oh, gosh. Oh, I rubbed too hard. The silk tore. Gee, be careful. Do you think there's really anything written on that silk? Hmm. Gosh. Here, dip this cloth in the water again, will you? Don't you see anything yet? No, not yet, no. The dirt's coming off easier than I thought. Here's the cloth. Thanks. Now then. Here. Here. Anything yet? There's something here. Can you tell what it is? No, not yet, Jim. Don't get excited. But gosh, it it might be anything. It might be a treasure map or something written by some old pirate. Wait. I'm getting it now. Gosh, let me look. Let me look. There. Just wipe this part off here and... What is it? Well, I'll be... What is it, Mr. Kent? Jim, it's the most amazing... Well, here. Have a look for yourself. What is on the piece of oiled silk that makes it so valuable to Teak Barnaby and so amazing to Clark Kent? Is it a treasure map, as Jimmy suspects? Be sure to hear the next thrilling episode of our story with Superman. Tune in the next thrilling installment of the transcription feature, Superman. Up in the sky. Look. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman.
Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. And we'll hear that next episode on Thursday's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thanks for making us a part of your Tuesday. Coming up tomorrow, Crime Club, Gangbusters, Suspense, Dangerous Assignment, and The Strange Dr. Weird. We'll see you tomorrow. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, which is me.